testimony that we heard that we will use in order to uh, ultimately propose and maps to the legislature. After those round of meetings, we conferred with research and polling, uh, advanced criteria for them to consider in drawing maps. They had drawn maps, the public has drawn maps for us, and we on September 16th adopted some concepts. My plan for today is to have research and polling go through all of the concepts, Congress, the State Senate, the State House, the Public Education Commission, then I will see if there is anybody on Zoom who wants to talk about any of the maps that uh, were described by research and polling. Uh, if uh, once we conclude with Zoom comments, then I have uh, arranged to have uh, the Navajo Nation make some presentations to us, beginning with, I believe, Patty Williams. We will proceed along uh, those lines. It's very important. This, this is a very important meeting because as President Ness indicated, we have criteria that by law we must follow. But more than that, what the legislature has required of us uh, is to make sure that we have compact districts that are contiguous, that take into consideration communities of interest. And above those traditional redistricting principles, is the Voting Rights Act. And we are told that we are not to consider or rely or refer to partisan data such as voting history or party registration data, except that voting history and elections may be considered to ensure that the district plan complies with applicable federal law. The applicable federal law that we need to be concerned about is the Voting Rights Act. And what people will tell you are the jingles factors that we will need a record on in order to uh, assure the legislature that we have not diluted the voting strength of a minority group. In fact, once we adopt maps, which will take place on October 15th, the law requires the committee to provide written evaluations of each district plan that address the satisfaction of the requirements uh, set forth in the redistricting act that we comply with all those principles and also that the ability of racial and language minorities to elect candidates of their choice uh, was not impaired we have to provide a measure of partisan fairness and an explanation as to the preservation of communities of interest so the public input that we receive today will be very important to uh, allow us to draw minimum of three maps for Congress, the State House, the State Senate, and Public Education Commission, and to demonstrate that the, the ability of racial and language minorities to elect candidates of their choice remains, that we have done all we can to preserve communities of interest. The overarching principle always begins with one person, one vote, and for that purpose, uh, we, for Congress, try to reach a 0.00 percent deviation of the congressional maps. Otherwise, we by law have to have a, the specificity, the rationale for deviating above that. The legislation allows us to, for state offices to deviate up to 10 percent. The legislation is written that you shall not go above 10 percent and we are prohibited by law from submitting any maps to the legislature that exceed the 10% deviation. Historically, New Mexico has used a plus or minus 5% to get to the total deviation of 10%. Uh, the question is whether or not you can depart from that. Uh, I believe that legal requirements or exceptional circumstances would permit us to deviate, but you also have to take into consideration the practicalities of using large deviations. If you had a negative 8% deviation, for example, now you have limited the rest of the state to a positive two uh, deviation. And that could interfere with our ability to uh, draw communities of interest or protect other uh, voting age population minority majority districts. So with that in mind, uh, 
I look forward to the public comment today, but to get us started, I will call on research and polling to begin with the con congressional maps that are concepts that we have advanced. Thank I you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, many members, public. Pleasure to be here today at Crown Point, New Mexico. So as the chairman suggested, first we'd like to go over some congressional concepts. We have seven of them. As you all know, um, in New Mexico, we have three congressional districts. During the census, New Mexico didn't gain or lose any congressional districts. We kept up with the three that we had. And as the chairman suggested, because of federal case law, it's important that those three congressional districts have nearly identical population. So every 10 years, we adjust the boundaries to account for population shifts. So all of the concepts we'll go over very quickly here. Uh, you can assume that each district has nearly identical population. Um, the deviations, as the chairman suggested, um, come to 0.0%. Now, as we travel around the state, we focus on the region, of course, that we're in here in northwest of New Mexico. We don't go over what's happening in uh, Rio Rancho or Olvis. For the most part, we stick to the region. So one of the reasons we can move quickly is because in all of the concepts, McKinley and San Juan County are in the same district. And in all the concepts, that is the northern congressional district. There are some differences in how the North is uh, structured in some of these plans, but basically in all the plans, McKinley and San Juan counties are in the same district and it's in the North. Um, Cibola County does vary uh, by some of the concepts. And of course, Cibola County is important to Northwest New Mexico. 10 years ago or into the current district, Cibola County, Tubala County is uh, in Southern New Mexico, but some of our plans have Tubala County in the Northern District to unify more of the Native American voice. So without further ado then, Michael, the concept A. Concept A, again, you see the three congressional districts and you see basically that there's a Northern District core, an Albuquerque Torrance County District core, and a Southern New Mexico core. Uh, under this status quo oriented plan, Torrance County remains with Bernalillo, Placitas, and Bernalillo. Cibola County is in CD2, the second congressional district, as is Espeta under this plan. Notice that Tahajali, though, um, which is, as you, of course, in Bernalillo County, uh, does stay in the Northern congressional district under this plan. Under concept B, again, concept B is a status quo oriented plan where Torrance County is with Bernalillo Placitas and the town of Bernalillo. Um, Sandia Pueblo under this plan is in the uh, first congressional district. But Cibola County continues in the second congressional district. The change here in this, <coughs> excuse me, Status quo oriented plan is that his letter uh, is in the uh, second congressional, first congressional district. Now it's important to remember these concepts were drawn up over a month ago. Um, and so we continue every day to get new feedback from people throughout the state, including the Native American tribes. But these concepts were developed a month ago. Concept C. Um, also is status quo oriented. You see that same Northern New Mexico base, you see San Juan County, McKinley County, but in this case, Cibola County as well, all in the Northern Congressional District. So when you put uh, Cibola County in the Northern District, it's also adjacent to Alamo. So Alamo, a Navajo reservation in uh, Northern Socorro County gets unified into a third congressional district when Cibola is also included in CD3. Concept D, now we're moving a little away from status quo. This is an Albuquerque Santa Fe district where um, one author of this bill had the vision 
of uh, we're putting Albuquerque and Santa Fe, Edgewood, East Mountains of Albuquerque, all in one congressional district. If we zoom out a bit, we can also see that uh, some of those east side counties bordering Oklahoma and Texas are all unified from Union County on down under this plan. But we still, and this plan also, Zuni Pueblo is intentionally split as it was requested 10 years ago. And we recently received word from Zuni they prefer that again. But most of the core of CB2 and CB3 is retained. Um, and, and you can see again, San Juan McKinley um, stay within that Northern District. The next concept is an urban Albuquerque Rio Rancho district. One thing quite different about this plan, we had some feedback as we traveled around the state about the unincorporated area in the South Valley and whether it could be included in some plans in a Southern New Mexico district that uh, some people spoke of that the unincorporated areas in the South Valley might have something shared in common with you know going down to Berlin and Vaquita and right down to Anthony and Sunlin Park. And so this concept uh, does that. But as it does do that, uh, it does retain a Northern Congressional District core. Concept F, also an Albuquerque urban district, including Rio Rancho, uh, but CD2 and CD3 do retain their core. Notice how the East Mountains of Albuquerque are included in the Northern District. Um, the, the, the vision was that the East Mountains might have more of a rural uh, feel to them. Um, Cibola County goes north, allowing Alamo, Navajo to go north as well. And then under the final plan, Um, again, I know we're very redundant here, but San Juan and McKinley, Cibola, all in the Northern District. Um, this uh, plan has uh, Albuquerque and most of Rio Rancho in, in one urban district, but uh, Cibola, Alamo go north. Um, so most of the plans retain the core of the three districts, variations along the way, Alamo here, because Cibola goes north can as well. Uh, this has a Northern, North Central, Northwestern core, but more of Eastern New Mexico is unified under this particular plan. So that would be, uh, Mr. Chairman, a uh, quick summary of uh, the congressional plans and particularly as they affect this region. Uh, if we now move to the Senate briefly, again, we'll stick to the region. And, um, I also want to say again, these concepts were drawn up over a month ago before we received a lot of feedback from a lot of people. So in concept A, we're gonna go over actually two concepts because concept B and C are the same as it relates to Northwestern New Mexico. So under this uh, concept, um, we, as we look at Northwestern New Mexico, what we end up having is that this concept maintains three very strong Native American majority voting age districts. And it does it by utilizing Laguna Acoma and Zuni Pueblos as part of the majority Native American voting age districts. So under this concept, the three Native American voting age districts have 70% Native American, 72%, and 77%. And the population deviations are well within plus or minus 5% within this particular plan. If we look a little closer, we'll see one of the districts is predominantly Pueblo and Hickoria, uh, District 22. We'll talk a little more about it in a moment. Two of the districts are predominantly Navajo. Also, this plan accomplishes uh, its objective by not going into Rio Rancho or Chama or Tierra Almeria or deeply into Valencia County to help populate the Native American majority districts. But the consequence of this plan is that it does not have a, a Native American uh, influence district, the commonly called Senate District 30. So looking quickly, Senate District 1, 
Farmington based, Kirtland, Fruitland, 33% Native American. It's an influence district, but by no means majority. District two, Aztec, Bloomfield, Florida Vista, Blanco based district. District three is part of Gallup and it goes up to Shiprock through the reservation. District four, part of Gallup also up the reservation, including Nagisi Orfano um, and skirting Far Farmington. And it also goes toward Milan and part of Grants. And then if we look at Senate District 22, which is vast, but notice that Zuni Pueblo, Laguna, Acoma, Isleta, six of the Sandoval, seven Pueblos, and then up through Counselor and Torreon, Alamo, I, I left out there as well, uh, since it's uh, adjacent to Cibola County and Hickoria. So 10 of the Pueblos are included in this one Pueblo-based district. So this plan is a little different from many of the others. Um, the, the advice we're getting from Navajo and Pueblo is to retain a, a Native American influence district, but this particular plan does show that it's possible to create three Native American voting age districts, 70% or higher, stick within the plus or minus 5% uh, deviation. Mr. Sandra, can you just take the three districts by number that are 70, 72, and 75 percent? Yes. In, in District 3 is 76.8 percent. Native American, and this is the non-Hispanic single race Native American. It's not the higher number. It's 80% if you include Native Americans of all races. Um, we, we'll stick with the non-Hispanic Native American to honor that request. Um, District four is 71.5% and District 22 is 70.3%. Okay, moving on to concept B and C, they're the same. Okay, so again, before we received any feedback, we said to ourselves, 10 years ago, the Native American Working Group suggested a plan. That plan was approved by the courts. We used that as our starting point because we wanted to honor those requests. But we then adjusted the boundaries to account for population loss. As we all know, Northwestern New Mexico, when you include the Farmington Aztec Bloomfield area, which is then surrounded by the Native American districts, did not keep pace with population growth. So their districts need to expand their boundaries. So this particular plan started out with the current uh, that, that which the working group had approved 10 years ago. And then on our own, we tried to adjust the boundaries to account for population uh, change. So this district, this plan does include District 30, a Native American influence district, which includes Zuni, Acoma, Laguna, Isleta, and Los Lunas uh, in it. Um, under the, uh, Michael, if, if for a moment, just turn on the existing districts. Now we're not saying this is, identical to the existing districts because we had to adjust the boundaries to account for population change. But notice that the black line, which is current districts, you will see, let's say in district four going up the reservation, districts one and two, uh, the south end of district four, uh, you, you will see some coming out. It was our good faith attempt to start with status quo and adjust accordingly. Um, under this plan, the deviations stick within the plus or minus 5%, but the Native American adult populations are not as strong. Uh, in one of the districts, um, it's 60.5%. In another, it's 68.1%. And in another, it's 71.8% Native American non-Hispanic voting age. In this plan, uh, Senate District 1 in the Farmington-based district, Kirtland, Fruitland, it's 30% Native American. Those so-called non-Native American districts had to increase their percent Native American because they're all 
expanding their boundaries, boundaries into Native American lands because of population loss. Senate District 2 is an Aztec, Bloomfield, Florida Vista, Blanco based district. CD3, most of Gallup up to Shiprock through the reservation. District 4, part of Gallup towards Grants and Milan. Senate District 22, Hickoria, uh, Navajo Reservation, Sandoval Pueblos, and Tahajali uh, is included in there. And then Senate District 30, the Native American Influence District with Zuni Pueblo, Laguna, Acoma, Alamo, Isleta, and Western uh, parts, Los Lunas and Western Valencia County. So again, concepts being seen the same, it was an attempt to work with the prior districts and then expand the boundaries to account for population shifts. Thank you, Brian. Try this. All right, I guess that's better. Thank you, Brian, for talking about the Senate districts. I'll go into House and PRC uh, briefly as well. My name is Michael Sharp, by the way, and uh, assisting Brian, or the assistant to Brian. And uh, so we'll take a look at concept A for the House. One thing to remember for us is the Northwest part of the districts did uh, not keep pace with the state of Mexico with respect to population and uh, in fact, lost population. So one of the challenges is when drawing the districts and trying to stay within plus or minus 5% is how do we create districts that still maintain uh, majority voting, voting age uh, Native American populations and while sticking within plus or minus 5% is one of our goals of drawing these plans. So within concept A, uh, we, had, we still kept the three Farmington districts. Uh, District one is a Farmington base, two is Farmington, a little bit into Bloomfield, and three was uh, Aztec Bloomfield uh, district. In terms of, as we go south, District four uh, is Shiprock, south of Bloomfield, Kirtland, Fruitland, uh, Snosti, and then down into uh, Sheep Springs. District five, is Nagizi to Burnham, Red Lake, Vicente, through Church Rock and Gallup, which it splits with nine. Uh, District six is purple right here in the middle of the screen. It's from Pinedale and Mariana Lake down through down to Zuni and Rama and over to parts of Grants. District nine is kind of right in the Gallup area, but it goes uh, from Twin Lakes through Red Rock Red Springs and also in the Gallup. Uh, 69, one of the comments we've heard is that uh, Chaco uh, go into a Pueblo-based district or at least a district with Pueblos in it, so Chaco into House 69. So it's Acoma, Laguna, Alamo, Sleta, uh, Tahajli up in the Chaco, White Rock, and Lake Valley uh, Council and also includes White Horse. Lake. District 65 uh, starts in, in, uh, in Korea. This is very similar to what we have today. So it starts in Hickory, just moves south from Torreon, Cuba, and all the Sandoval County Pueblos, and into the uh, Sandia Pueblo through Bernalillo. It does pick up a little bit of Rio Rancho. This is the Mariposa development on the west side of Hunter, within uh, Rio Rancho. Prior to, so the, we have six Native American districts. Uh, Five or four or above 60% uh, non Hispanic Native American, uh, uh, Native American alone, not combining various Native American races, combinations of races. We have another one that's 59.9, which is House Six. And uh, one thing to remember these are concepts. If there are modifications that we can make, we can tweak them here and there. I think it's possible to make that District Six uh, just a sensible above 60% non Hispanic uh, Native American. Well, 65, one of the challenges with 65 is because we had to add population uh, within the region is it did pick up population that was a uh, non-Native American. And so District 65, while it is a majority uh, Native American, it's just over 50%. Okay, can I ask you? Let me just ask you a question about that. Uh, San Juan County, have they resolved uh, precinct splits? 
So, Mr. Chair, we, some of them. Oh, yes. Oh, so what you see on the screen is district duties that are precincts prior to the precinct changes to San Juan County. And uh, another question. By my analysis, you have the uh, six districts, Native American districts, but you have a total of 29 Hispanic voting age population districts, 13 of which exceed 60%. Is that correct? If you don't have that. Mr. I'd have to confirm that. <laughs> okay. I, I, I have 26. Okay. So I can double check that. <laughs> Next concept. Concept B is very similar to A. Really, the only difference in the northwest part of the state is that House 65 uh, in the previous plan, it did go into Rio Rancho, picked up Mariposa. In this plan, House 65 does not go into Rio Rancho, uh, but instead it adds uh, Pena Blanco, which is east of Cochiti, and uh, Ponderosa within Santa Barbara County, which is north of Lemus. And then it also adds uh, the Lumberton area uh, outside of Dulce. So it has a sizable uh, acre of population within the precinct uh, just east of Dulce. Otherwise, uh, the plan in the Northwest is the same as A. Concept C is a little bit of a different take, uh, primarily in the rest of the state, and also, uh, I guess, in Northwestern New Mexico as well. Uh, once again, in the Farmington area, we have three uh, Farmington area districts, one, two, and three. Three is a little bit different in that it does include Aztec, Bloomfield, and it goes into uh, uh, and includes Werfenau. Uh, district two is Farmington district and uh, south of the San Juan. District four is Shiprock, Kirtland, Fruitland, uh, almost. So District 4, I have the numbers on so everybody can see them. The Ship Rock, Kirtland, Fruitland, down to Sinosti. District 5. Is Burnham to Great Hills uh, down through Chiprock uh, parts of Gallup and then uh, through Blue Water and into Grants. District 6 it starts at uh, Red Rock south of Gallup and uh, goes to Zuni, Rama, over to include Acoma, Alamo, Alamo in Socorro County. It goes into Valencia County, east of uh, Lynn. It also picks up one precinct for population purposes in Patrick County. I believe that's Pi Town. Uh, District 9 uh, includes Gallup, plus areas north and west of Gallup, up to Red Lake, uh, Mexico Springs, and also off to the west of Gallup, and Juan uh, Manuelito. 69 uh, also includes uh, Chaco and uh, White Rock and Lake Valley down through Pueblo Cotado and uh, Crown Point down through uh, Peru. And also includes Laguna and Isleta, as, long, as well as Tahaji. District five, uh, 65, similar to the previous plan, starts in Hickory, moves south, uh, picks up the Gizi, Torreo, and Cuba and the Pueblos of Sandoval County in San Diego Pueblo. In this particular plan, there are six uh, adult Native American, non-Hispanic Native American districts above 60, and one that's above 60, 60 excuse me, above 56%. So it's a little bit stronger than when compared to uh, the first two concepts with respect to the Native American uh, population with the six districts. Concept D was, uh, when we looked at the first two concepts, uh, we saw that uh, we had some districts that were close to 60% and we thought, well, what would happen if we created five strong Native American districts, all over 60% the non-Hispanic Native American, stayed within the plus or minus 5%, and then created an influence district within San Diego County. And concept D 
is the result. Uh, districts one, two, and three in Farmington, similar to uh, the previous plan. Uh, district four, it's again, district four is always in Kirtland, Kirtland, Shiprock, Shiprock based uh, district. District nine start, starts south of Sinasti, from Vicente uh, down through Pinedale and over the, uh, that's nine, I'm sorry. Uh, nine starts at two great hills in Newcomb, down through Rock Springs and into Gallup. And district five is Vicente through uh, Pinedale and over to Chichota and Mamalito, parts of Gallup. And, was, and it has a little part of, of Raymond as well. This one long skinny precinct. It's a piece of Raymond that's in the county. And district six, uh, it starts at Zuni and goes, takes the rest of Raymond, goes into Grants, and up through, through Crown Point, Smith Lake, and White Horse Lake. Whereas District 9, I think I just mentioned earlier, 69 is a little bit of different take because uh, previously 65 had, had Hickorya. In this case, we thought, uh, well, look what happens if 69 starts with Hickorya, moves down, down south. It's a vertical district that includes uh, through Councilor at uh, Chaco, Pueblo Pantado, down through Laguna Nakama, Alamo, Sleda, and Tahachi. Where 65, is the what we'll call the influence district it includes the Sandoval County Pueblos as well as parts of uh, Rio Rancho and the Phoenix Mountains. So we have five uh, districts that are, that are above sixty percent non-Hispanic Native American, as well as one we call it an influence district, where District sixty-five is in the mid thirties with respect to uh, Native American population adult. Thank you. Okay, Michael, and just for the public's information, yesterday at, uh, at our meeting, we moved the Center for Civic Policy map uh, with identification T4968 into our CRC concepts, but we agreed that that would not be evaluated by research and polling until Friday's meeting at the National Hispanic Cultural Center. Just so the public understands it, it is posted on our website, as concept E. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And finally, we're going to quickly go through one PEC plan, and basically the rest of this are identical with respect to the north, northwest part of the state. And uh, District 5 is the northwest part of the state. Uh, District 5, that's McKinley County, San Juan County, in Korea within Rio Riba, and the Torreon and Cuba within Sandoval counties. County, excuse me. And District 5 stays exactly the same with respect to Plan A, Concept A, Concept D, Concept C. If folks are curious about B and C, it treats uh, the eastern part and southeastern part of the state a little bit differently with the District 8, District 9, currently more vertically oriented, whereas in B and C, Districts 8 and 9 are uh, unsat, if you will, one top of the other. And a few differences between districts four and ten, and some districts within Albuquerque are the main differences uh, between concepts A and C. Okay, does that conclude the Public Education Commission? That concludes this thing. I would like to invite uh, people attending by Zoom to address the Citizen Redistricting Committee about any of the concepts that have been described including the concept uh, submitted by the Center for Civic Policy. You are welcome to comment on uh, not only the Northwest region, but any uh, aspect of these concepts. So, uh, if there's any hands up, Sunny, let me know. None yet, sir. Okay, there being none. Uh, Patty Williams. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you, Chief Justice, Commission, and guests in the audience who came out to Crown Point. Welcome. I'm Patty Williams. I'm a consultant for the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission, which has been tasked by the Navajo Nation government to draw redistricting maps. I also um, litigated for six weeks redistricting cases 
in 2010-2011 census. So the Navajo Nation has been part of a Native American um, redistricting working group for months um, on redistricting issues common to uh, all the tribal entities in New Mexico. Together, the participating tribes and pueblos adopted redistricting principles and guidelines to protect Native American voters in compliance with the Voting Rights Act and the doctrine of tribal self-determination. You have been provided with a handout of the adopted principles. And I'm gonna go over them pretty um, quickly. Um, the first is tribal self-determination. Tribal self-determination is a concept that um, tribal communities are in the best position to determine what is best for their own communities. In fact, New Mexico law, um, including SB 304, which is your enabling legislation, um, requires the courts to consider self-determination as a factor in drawing legislative districts. And that is quite an important factor to the tribes. The other is that there is no retrogression. The tribes seek to maintain the six house districts that were created in the last redistricting round. In the house, that's districts four, five, six, nine, 65, and 69. And Senate districts, there's three of them that are minority majority districts, three, four, and 22. So those districts, it is imperative from the Navajo Nation's perspective that we do not go below um, having six in the House and three in the Senate. They also have, um, and that works through as a, Justice Chavez said, the jingles factors. Um, the jingles factors create the definition of what a protected minority is. And I think there's no dispute that tribal entities are a protected minority for voting rights purposes and have been for some time. I wanna give you a little history um, about why Jingles recognizes that tribal entities are protected. Under article one of the United States constitution, Indians not taxed were not counted as population for a state for purposes of apportionment, otherwise known as redistricting. In Dred Scott versus Stanford, an 1856 case said that Native American people could become citizens through their acquisition, acquisition of citizenship by way of naturalization, not by birth in the United States. The court held in that case that Indian tribes may without doubt, like the subjects of any foreign government, be naturalized by the authority of Congress and become citizens of the state of the United States. And if an individual should leave his tribe or nation and take up his abode among the white population, he would be entitled to all the rights and privileges which would belong to an immigrant from any other foreign country. In 1868, the 14th Amendment declared that citizens born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof were citizens. However, the jurisdiction requirement was interpreted to exclude Native Americans. And in 1870, the Senate Judiciary Committee further clarified this matter. The 14th Amendment of the Constitution has no effect whatsoever on the status of Indian tribes within the limits of the United States. About 8% of the native population at the time qualified for US citizenship because they were taxed. Others obtained citizenship by serving in the military marrying whites or accepting land allotments. And uh, the exclusion of Native Americans from US citizenship was further established in Elk versus Wilkins, 
when the Supreme Court held that a Native person born a citizen of a recognized tribal nation was not born an American citizen and could not become one simply by voluntary, voluntarily leaving his tribe and settling among whites. Through that civil war, this kind of attitude continued and they declared that Indians were not citizens of the United States until 1866 and that they were declared to be citizens of the United States. In 1924, four years after the 19th Amendment secured the rights of women to vote, the Indian Citizenship Act, also known as the Schneider Act, granted Native Americans US citizenship and the right to vote. In 1848, I mean 1948, I'm sorry, we've gone 100 years now, Arizona and New Mexico were some of the last states to extend full voting rights to Native Americans, which had been opposed by some Western states in contravention to the India Citizenship Act of 1924. Utah did not fully recognize the voting rights of Native Americans until 1962. These are the three states in which the Navajo Nation sits. The Voting Rights Act of 1965, signed by Lyndon Johnson, was enacted during the height of the Civil Rights Movement to provide protections for voter registration and voting by racial minorities, including language minorities and including Native Americans. The act was extended four times, most recently in 2006 by President Bush. During the redistricting conducted in 1991, New Mexico was required to seek pre-clearance under the Voting Rights Act based on the 1980 census, which sparked legal claims that New Mexico's process was discriminatory. We are no longer under preclearance. In fact, preclearance doesn't exist anymore, but um, we still need to be cognizant that we are complying as a state with the requirements of the Voting Rights Act. In Shelby County versus Holder in 2013, the United States Supreme Court struck down the coverage formula, but that doesn't mean those principles are not still the law in New Mexico and the rest of the United States. It just means that there's not an enforcement process that is significant as there was before. So that's why the issues of redistricting the Northwest quadrant of New Mexico are so important because we need to comply with state and federal law under the jingles requirements, Native Americans are a protected minority. One of the next principles that were accepted by the Native Voting Group, uh, redistricting work group, are that the districts to be true minority majority districts, which can elect a candidate of choice. The Native American non-Hispanic voting age population ideally should be 65%. That's based on undercounting, that's based on voting practices, and that's based on traditional um, discrimination against that minority as demonstrated in cases and a line of cases that has been um, developed for 200 years on most. The other principle that was adopted is that there's no dilution. This is a traditional voting principle, um, redistricting principle, that there's no cracking of districts to dilute the vote by spreading them among many districts and no packing. Navajo would like to see districts that are less than 75%. Otherwise, there's a presumption of packing. But obviously in the House, a couple of districts need to go a little above 75 just because the demographics in those areas. And we're really cognizant of trying to unpack those districts as much as possible. Um, and so that's something that we are looking at. 
One of the reasons and one of the ways that unpacking meeting the 65% non-Hispanic Native American gap and no retrogression can happen is by using a standard deviation um, that allows districts to be drawn either a little below or a little above the ideal size. A plus or minus 5% standard deviation does not achieve six house districts above 60%. I mean, enough that it's 60. Last time, the lowest district was 62.9% in the House. Um, and this, none of the plans um, that don't get to 60% or more in six districts in the House and three districts in the Senate, um, we, we would say do not comply with the Voter Right Act because they're retrogressive. We're losing a control of the ability to elect a candidate of their choice in a minority majority district controlled by, by um, Native American voters. So the Navajo Nation strongly advocates that the CRC, you, clarify that it will be using the standard stated in SB 304. I don't know how it's been codified, but it's section eight, A2, which states no plan for state office will be considered that have a total deviation of more than 10%. That doesn't say plus or minus five. And in fact, the first um, iteration of the bill that was introduced by Representative Dow in the House, which became the bill that um, created this uh, entity, actually said plus or minus 5%, and that was changed. So there is intent that you are not stuck with the plus or minus 5% if there's a legitimate consideration for going above or below that number. And there is a legitimate consideration given the Native American redistricting principles that there's no retrogression and that we're looking at an ideal non-Hispanic Native American PAP of 65% ideally. So we call that the floating deviation, the 10% plus or minus to get to a total because it floats around the ideal size. And that has been um, uh, clarified in Harris, versus Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission, a US Supreme Court case at 36, S Court 1301. It's a 2016 case. And it states, there was a challenge that there was, that the districts were insufficiently equal in population in Arizona. They were too far off, 5% um, standard deviation. And the holding in that case is because the maximum population deviation between the largest and the smallest district was less than 10%, the appellates could not simply rely on the number to show that the plan violates the Constitution. The case goes on to describe a line of cases, Daphne versus Cummings, um, Brown versus Thompson, that say that um, less than 10% total deviation is, quote, we have defined as minor deviations those in an apportionment plan with a maximum population deviance of deviation under 10%. So you have Supreme Court authority that says you're not bound by the plus or minus 5%. If you have legitimate considerations, for going beyond the 5%. And it is presumptively constitutional. And it's something that the Navajo Nation and its allies um, would request that this body clarify through resolution, or I don't know what your, um, what your process would be, 
that um, as we move closer to the deadline for um, adopting maps to assist coalition maps, which has been a stated um, preference for this body and for the legislature, that the CRC pass a resolution clarifying its position on maps using a total deviation or floating deviation of 10% as opposed to plus or minus 5% maps, which bind Native American minority majority districts to an unrealistic ability to have the principle of no retrogression recognized. It's, it seems simple that you would follow the um, enabling legislation for your activities, but there has been some confusion about that, and we would request clarification on that um, so that as we move toward tweaking the concepts and working with other bodies and entities, that we have clear guidance from you that a plan will not be rejected if it has a standard deviation outside plus or minus 5% or 6%, but a total deviation of 10% from the most populous district to the least populous district. So we would ask that you do that for um, citizen mappers moving forward. Um, thank you for your consideration. And I think it is, oh, questions. Uh, I'll have some questions, but any questions from the committee? Uh, let's go to Zoom first. Any question? Any hands up, Sonny? No, there's no hands up. No hands up on Zoom from committee members. Member Curtis? So, Ms. Williams, it's uh, nice to see you not on the other side of the case from me. That's right. Yeah, so um, thank you for being here. I really appreciate the work that you've done. I, I have a, I want to understand the standard deviation issue from uh, the tribe's perspective a little bit better, okay? Uh, I completely agree with you about the issue that plus or minus 5% is not the standard. That's clearly not what the law says, but I want to understand how it impacts other districts in the state, right? Where we have like, um, you know, I mean, we have different issues down in Southeast New Mexico, right? And so if, for instance, I don't know why this is doing that. See if it stops. Okay. So I just want to understand how if, I have two questions. If the standard deviation is 8%, so that we can get to the 65% gap, um, then what does that do to the rest of the state and the deviation that's allowed within those other districts? Well, we know that in the last redistricting process, it was achievable and without retrogression. And in fact, they added districts and added influence districts by minority majority populations. So we know that it is achievable, and we know what ranges it's achievable within. Navajo Nation has drawn maps where we get the ideal district at 65% Native American map, but those standard deviations are high. Mr. Gorman will show those to you. But we understand that you have to consider not just the Northwest Quadrant, but the entire state. And so they are willing to negotiate off the 65% ideal Native American map. And what we know looking at some of the plans and the maps is that we were looking, one of the first ones that we saw and found, the, the plus because their population loss throughout the state was 2.9. So we drew plans that took it to a minus 7.1 deviation so that you could meet the goal throughout the entire state, which I know is your charge. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are ways to do that and meet these principles of redistricting and not have retrogression and have sufficient numbers in those districts that are Native American controlled to allow them a candidate of their choice. So there is obviously a fine line between everyone getting what they want 
and working with numbers that you can build a map for the entire state. And we believe that the 10% get, you can get there in a variety of ways, in fact, without retrogression and with high enough Native American tax to be effective. Okay, and then just so I understand, what is retrogression in this setting? Are you saying anything below 62.9% is retrogression? That is the, that's our position. Okay, I just- We're losing voting, Native American voting strength mm -hmm. in any district that they now control that it's retrogressive. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I understood the number sure. that you're working with. The ideal number is 65%, mm -hmm. but because of the population demographics, that can't be achieved in every district, and we know that. And so they're willing to go below the 65% to, to have a realistic map. Um, so yes, anything else? No, those are the two questions I had. Did thank I you. answer them adequately for you? You did, thank okay, you thank very you. much. Thank you. Justice? And I apologize if, if I covered some territory that is visiting. Uh, <clears throat> I, I did want to talk to you about that because you said there's some confusion. The legislation itself presents some ambiguity. I do know because I was very involved in trying to get the redistricting act adopted. And I do know that it was plus or minus 5% stated in there and that the legislators decided to allow the total deviation of 10%. They did not define for us what that would be, how you would get there, which is fine. But they also added some language that was unusual, that we should honor traditional redistricting, redistricting principles. You know, as a lawyer, that we cannot read out of legislation language that is there. And so when they say that, what do you think about? They listed all the traditional redistricting principles within the redistricting act, but they wanted that in there. So the question is, are they telling us look at historically what the redistricting principles have been in New Mexico. When you look at the guidelines that were written in 2001 and 2011, it says plus or minus 5%. It cites to the white versus register case. And so we begin as a citizens committee under the premise that let's try to accomplish all of the goals with a plus or minus 5%. I have written comments on about maps uh, with the authority of the citizen redistricting committee. And what I specified was that absent a legal requirement or exceptional circumstances, districts should not exceed plus or minus 5% in arriving at a 10% population deviation from the ideal. So I recognize that there's an exception to that. Uh, are you telling me that it is not clear? The legal requirement, the obvious legal requirement in my mind is compliance with the Voting Rights Act. If we establish that there is a cohesive minority group that votes as a block and that the majority can uh, beat the, the block, then I think that an adequate deviation to accomplish that goal is, is permissible. And exceptional circumstances is, is broad language. Um, I agree, Justice Chavez, that plus or minus 5% is the path of least resistance. But you are given other tools in that legislation, including tribal boundaries and, and community boundaries and community of interest. And those under the line of cases, jingles being one of them, and it tells you how a minority, a protected minority is, is defined. And then through the Gaffney, Brown, and Harris line of cases, it tells you that you can get a 9.9% without constitutional um, pushback at all in order to protect legitimate considerations, which are outlined in SB 304. And so I think you can go well beyond plus or minus 5% from the ideal size if you have a legitimate articulable consideration and protection 
of communities of interest and a protected minority under the Voter Rights Act, I think is really absolutely defensible. So my statement in the comments seems out of it. And I was authorized to comment on that. So it, it seems to me we have agreement because I agree. Traditional redistricting principles are not thrown out the window because of the DRA. In fact, you're invited to consider them, right? Yes, and I think that the political the, boundaries are very important. We yes. push for the legislation that would acknowledge tribal boundaries, so I understand that. And I know that through the task force, because I attended those meetings right. as well, that you discussed that plus or minus 5% was too constrictive if you were considering other legitimate considerations. And we are asking you to clarify that through this body as well. Um, so that the coalitions can uh, draft maps that go beyond the plus or minus 5%. And I don't know that plus or minus 5% is a traditional redistricting principle. It's a calculus that has been used at least through two cycles, but I don't think, and it has been deviated from in the last cycle for sure, because we, we went below that in some of the districts, um, and so I don't know that the calculus is a principle. I think it's a tool to meet the principles of redistricting that are enumerated in the statute. You may be right, that, that's what lawyers argue about all the time. Sure, that's sure. Your word. <laughs> uh, so, I'm gonna go back. If you want, I can ask for a formal vote that states that absent a legal requirement or exceptional circumstances, districts should not, not must not, should not exceed plus or minus 5% in arriving at a 10% population deviation from the ideal. That signals to the public, show us the legal requirement that meets the VRA requirement, show us the exceptional circumstances that we can do. As a lawyer, I would like to flip it that they can uh, deviate more than plus or minus 5% if there are legitimate considerations under traditional ex having that be um, clarified that it is allowed to go beyond if you have a legitimate consideration rather than the constriction that plus or minus 5% is controlled. That's a, that's a lawyer, all right. <laughs> Mr. Chair? Yes. Yeah. So, um, so Ms. Williams, I have to tell you, I have been the, the thorn in the side of the committee writing things that are in excess of what the legislation states. As far as uh, you know, creating some kind of uh, statement to the public, so they understand, you know, what the rules are. Um, I suppose we can talk about that, but our interpretation of the statute or making some kind of interpretation of the statute makes me sort of nervous. The uh, obviously the, the point here is meeting our Voting Rights Act requirements. I think we're all in agreement. I haven't heard anybody disagree with what you've said, and that is that the plus uh, plus or minus five percent is not the rule. We understand constitutionality is up to ten. That standard deviation of ten is allowable under certain circumstances, and clearly the tribes are going to qualify for that. Uh, under the Voting Rights Act as a protect, uh, protected entity, right? So I'm not sure the clarification that you're seeking is necessary. I understand why you're asking the question um, because, you know, this is a very serious issue that we're talking about. It's in place for 10 years. People need to understand that. But I know I understand that, right? And, and uh, for better or worse, we have a lot of lawyers on this, uh, on this committee they understand the word, uh, the wording of that statute. So uh, I'm con I always get concerned about is publishing something that would be an interpretation of legislative intent, which I don't really think we have a right to do. So uh, I'd be interested to hear if the other committee members have questions, uh, Justice. Uh, yeah, I've got some more questions. Yeah, too. thank you. Sure. Any, any committee members want to raise your hand? 
You want to say something? Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so two, uh, I guess two, one question and, and, um, and a little bit, I guess more of a comment. Uh, as one of the non-attorneys on the <laughs> on the uh, committee, um, so I, I'm not sure that I, I followed all of the uh, conversation that, that that we just had. Uh, one, one question is: I'd like to understand uh, retrogression and its context a, a, a little bit better because that seems to be a a foundational uh, uh, um, value uh, that 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 we're talking about. So. Um, if Ms. Williams, maybe you could uh, uh, explain that a little bit more and, uh, and and help me understand that. And then the the um, I guess what I'm struggling with is I, I don't do very well with abstractions. Uh, I'm a math teacher now. Uh, I used to be a community organizer, and before that, I was an engineer. So I, I like to see things. And so is there is there a, a is there any published map that is that we that I could look at? To understand what we're talking about in a not totally, but at least more concrete way, and that would be helpful for me at least. Thank you, Commissioner Sanchez. Um, Navajo has produced at three maps. I think two have been sent to research and polling in the last couple of days because there's a we use Maptitude, which is what uh, research and polling uses, and it doesn't translate well into Districtor. And it takes almost a whole day to move the plan into Districtor. And the precincts in San Juan County have not yet been uh, moved into Districtor in the way that Navajo has been using them as approved by the San Juan County Commission just last week. So retrogression is the theory that under the Voting Rights Act, if Native Americans have the numbers to control six house districts, that they should control six house districts with uh, minority majority population numbers that can be um, proven under the jingles factors. And I don't know if you're familiar with those or not, but it creates a little test on how you can tell if a minority group is protected under the Voting Rights Act because traditionally they have been discriminated against and disenfranchised. So if New Mexicans, Native Americans are entitled to control six districts as a minority majority, then anything less than the numbers that should be used, which we think is 65% ideally um, that, that take the Native American numbers out of those districts um, below 60% or 62.9 is what the number that was used in the last redistricting is retrogressive. You're taking away something that they have um, proven that they are entitled to um, by the demographic, demographics um, described in the census, and that is be retrogressive. So going below six house districts and three Senate districts would be retrogressive. There's arguments, and I don't think any of the Native American working group is um, proposed maps that make more than six house districts or more than three Senate districts that are minority majority control but there are maps, because the numbers have um, changed some, there are maps which create Native American influence districts where they're not up to the 62.9%, but they are enough so that someone running in the district would have to um, meet the concerns of their constituents who are Native American in that district, rather than just saying, if they all voted against me, it wouldn't matter. And so, is, there, is there a hard number that, that is considered uh, an influence district? I don't think there is a hard number that's considered an influence district, but we try to bump the numbers up um, to above 30%. Okay. Um, and, then, and then we're looking at a district that Native Americans will have an influence in the candidate uh, selection in those districts. 
Someone else may have a different number that they would like to use, but I know that the working group was very interested in creating influence districts beyond the six in the House that are controlled and the three in the Senate that are Native American minority majority districts. And some of the maps show those influence districts. And so that's something to look at. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question, Commissioner? Let me interrupt your testimony and, yes, sir. and ask uh, Michael Sharp, will you pull up House Concept C? Or E? I, I'm not sure we have uh, House. House. State House. I, I just, and what I'd like you to do, Michael, is just demonstrate by going to Districter so that the committee and the public understand how you take a look at seeing whether or not there's a uh, majority minority district. It, it's basically looking at voting age population, but please take your time, go, go through that slowly. Chairman Chavez, Michael, sorry, there are some folks who are listening via radio and they wanna know how they can get on Zoom. Can I make a quick announcement or do you yes. wanna hold that? Um, so KCZY is broadcasting uh, this meeting. It's at 107.3 FM, it's the campus radio. For folks who are interested in dialing in or clicking in via Zoom, if you go to nmredistricting.org and the meetings and transparency tab, and you click on more information, you'll be able to find both the dial-in phone numbers if you have challenges with internet connectivity, and you'll also be able to find the phone numbers. So they're all there under more information. Thanks. Thank you, Lily. You are now in redistrictor. Hey, Mr. Chair, so the, uh, just a quick tutorial of, of districtor and how to, I guess, evaluate the plans based on the, the finding out how many districts are uh, majority Hispanic, majority Native American, and so on. So, real quickly, you have the state of New Mexico, uh, the the districts as uh, indicated by color, the uh, population of each district is in the first tab. So you can look at the population of every district. You can mouse over and hover over a particular districts. It'll tell you the deviation of each particular district as well as its total population. So for example, district one in this plan C, uh, district one has a deviation of negative 4.59% below the ideal population. And the number to, to remember at the bottom of this list, so that does it for every single district within district. And you can see at the, the, at the very bottom is the ideal population that's what we're shooting for. So folks are talking about the deviation from the ideal. It's when we traditionally say plus or minus 5%, it's plus or minus 5% above or below this 30,250 people. We're talking about a negative 7% below uh, 30,000, it's 30,250 times 0.93. Um, so that's 7% below, and we're talking about the other spectrum, the other side of that, it's going to be, you know, two point whatever percent above. It's our, our, as an example for a range, if below or seven and a half below, then the, the highest a deviation could be positive to 0.5. In this particular plan, the uh, maximum deviation shown at the bottom of the screen is 4.97%. That just tells you that there is a single district, that is, that is a district doesn't tell you which one it is, but one of those districts has a deviation of point or 4.97%. Uh, it's a little confusing in terms of the word maximum population deviation. It's not total population deviation. It's not saying whether or not the total range is 10% or less or 11 or eight or whatever it happens to be. It just indicates which district has the highest deviation from the ideal. So that's under the population tab. Uh, under the data layers tab, that's not really, you can look at population by race, uh, but that's more shady the state by, uh, by ethnicity. So you can shade the state and look at various uh, you know, gradients and gray scales, and it'll tell you, well, geez, if it's a, a, more, a stronger Native American precinct, then it's a, a darker color with the respect to the gray scale. 
And when we're looking at evaluating the districts individually by ethnicity, you can look at, in terms of Voting Rights Act, we will look at the voting age population by race. And then you can compare the various columns. You can look at uh, the Hispanic voting age population is the first column. Uh, you can look at the whites, but some of you uh, non-Hispanic white uh, in, in reality is the second column. And then the third column would be, uh, this is the, it doesn't say what is the non-Hispanic Native American voting age population, uh, single race. So then you can look at every district. So for example, uh, you know, one, two, and three in Farmington area has Hispanic voting age pop of 18% for district one, 62 for white, and 13, almost 14% for Native American. For district four, which is the Chiprock uh, area uh, plus more, the voting age Native American population is a non-Hispanic Native American is 80.4 for district five, 67.8, so on. And the darker the shading of the cell, it will indicate a, a higher percentage in terms of the percent voting age population. So then you're able to compare the various ethnicities within, within the state. Uh, in terms of evaluating the district. So then you can just simply say, well, there's one, two, for districts four, five, and six. I'll just count them up. Those are over 60%, for example. Districts four, five, and six, nine, that's four Native American districts. And they can go down to uh, district 69, it's over 60%. So that's five Native American, Native American districts over 60%, plus one is how 65 over 56% voting in the state of American population. Thank you, Michael. That's just an example, uh, Member Joaquin Sanchez, of how you can evaluate these maps. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Williams? Yes, sir. So, so going back to, to our discussion, uh, we'd love to have uh, evidence, and I believe you're going to give us some evidence of undercounting today. Yes, sir. There's some speakers who are following me that are going to talk about um, the problems with undercount on the Navajo Nation in particular, and they'll, they'll, they're happy to answer your questions about that. Okay, and then you mentioned that voting practices was also a reason that the principal 65% deviation, and uh, I, would, I would love to hear it. It doesn't have to be at this uh, meeting, but the voting practices, I think, it is an important. Thing yes, sure. Yes, Your sure, Honor, and it, it goes to uh, problems with registration, problems with voting on voting day or not, and on Navajo, voting day is like a holiday, and people want to go to the polls. So early polling places, they don't trust the U.S. mail, and there's been issues with that in the Arizona side for mail-in ballots. So they want to go to the polls and it's proven in there, they can be testimony about that at a different thing and put their ballot in the machine or in the box themselves because there's a traditional distrust of the government um, among Native Americans with good reason. And so that's the kind of voting practice I'm talking and uh, voting behavior that I'm talking about. And that has to be considered. Um, also, there's lots of problems um, with the Native American populations um, in the Arizona side in particular, that um, tribal identi identification cards are not accepted at polling places. So people go sometimes driving two hours to a polling place with their tribal identification card and they're denied the ability to vote. Are you saying that's on the Arizona side? Yes, there's been cases on the Arizona okay, side. Uh, all right. But that's the kind of behavior and the kind of documentation that Native Americans might rely on pretty uh, regularly that um, are affecting their ability to vote in um, elections for state officials and, and yeah. uh, federal elections. And I'm happy to fill that out with a paper or something else if you'd like. Yeah, it. right. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's important for us because as we evaluate these maps that we adopt, we have to explain to the legislature how it is that we protected a minority population's voting strength. And that's important. We also have to demonstrate that they vote as a block. Yes. And so I would urge you to present testimony on how it is that for each district that we want to preserve, how it is that they vote as a block. 
Well, that um, becomes an interesting question, Justice, because once there's a Native American minority majority district, sometimes, oftentimes, most times, people run unopposed in those districts. So there's not a lot of head-to-heads between a, a Native American and a non-Native American in the six districts in the House and the three districts in the Senate. People are running unopposed or they're running natively Native or non-Native and Native, okay? So it's, there's a dearth of information in the last 10 years for sure. Um, the last couple of election cycles. So you're, you're talking about racially polarized voting. Yes. And can you tell us what election? That is the only area we can think about partisan data is when we're trying to comply with the ERA. What elections would you recommend that we take a look at in order to assess whether there is racially polarized voting? Well, I can tell you some elections that are um, unopposed and like Munoz hasn't had an opponent in Senate District 4, I don't think since the last election cycle. Patty Lundstrom has not had an opponent in House District 9 um, because she's the candidate of choice, it appears. Um, and that's that would be the argument. I mean, someone else would say that's not what that means, but um, there, there's not... Um, the kind of data that you would find in other states where a black candidate is running against a white candidate in the South and have that kind of um, voting as a block information. Um, it's not that readily available in New Mexico. But I can, I can give you a rundown of the elections and, and who was opposed and who wasn't and when you had Native Americans head to head or Native American, non Native American head to head. Okay. Is there nonpartisan elections that might be uh, useful? I don't know that, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Um, the, the other thing uh, I would encourage you to help us out with is uh, actual shared interest. I think communities of interest still is a very important aspect of our job. So anything you can do to show that uh, our actual shared interest would be useful okay. to the committee. And I, 10 years ago, I, I read the findings and all of the testimony and, and it was developed there. So I'm confident that you can develop some, uh, some of the pueblos, for example, share common interest. I've heard about sacred lands and the importance of sacred lands. Yes. So that would be useful information. Okay, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the guidance. If there's not going to be a resolution, your guidance today on what you would consider, if you're not going to use a plus or minus 5% to go beyond that, but what would you need from submitters of maps in order to justify the greater standard of deviation to 10%? Is there something in the comments that we could add or what would be helpful? Well, what, we, what we've talked about, the VRA is, is, we have the jingles factors, okay, cohesive groups. We know that in New Mexico and where they exist. You have to demonstrate that they vote as a voting block and that the majority uh, can beat them otherwise unless you give them a sufficient voting age population. So, so it's basically that, and it's a lot of what I've talked about. I think uh, show, showing actual shared interest is important. I think showing um, poor voting practices caused by external uh, concerns is important as well. Uh, so I, I think I tried to give the guidance. Should we put it in the comments? I guess I'm asking for like the uh, nuts yeah. and bolts of how to do it. Well, we, we accept written testimony. Okay. on the website, that, that is acceptable. Uh, I love to hear from people. I, I've heard from a lot of passionate people uh, about the, their concerns and their communities of interest, what need they have, what interest they have. And I enjoy public testimony. We record it, we summarize it for the public. We indicate to the public where they can actually listen to the testimony themselves. So, uh, you have live testimony, I welcome that. 
the committee welcomes that. Yes, uh, that's that's the whole purpose, but it's a very unique system this year. We have an obligation to uh, spell out how it is that we comply with voting rights and preserve communities and government churches. That's going to be a lot of work. I agree, and we are happy to give you the tools that you need to accomplish your work. Thank you. Could, could I add something? To, oh, sorry. Uh, Ms. Curtis first. So, Ms. Williams, you know, very, very similar to findings of fact. Yeah, I mean, I, because I do believe to try to protect the maps. I, I, what I said is very similar to findings of fact. I'd be very interested to see, because I mean, the tribe has lawyers that are looking at this, you know, how do you believe you're meeting the jingles factors by doing this and meeting that constitutional requirement, all right, um, in, a, in a very specific way, all right, I appreciate the, the idea of it being in the commentary, but I would also encourage you to provide, as, uh, as our chair was stating, um, written testimony that sets out, you know, a very specific, not obtuse, I mean, what the position of the tribes are and how they're moving it, all the things that we've talked about, why the exception would be appropriate. I'm only speaking on behalf of my client, Navajo Nation, but I can provide you the findings and facts and conclusions of law that were submitted the last go round, which um, Justice Chavez is familiar with, which do show that all these factors were met and that, um, there's a cohesive all the factors, so I can I can provide those to you either as written testimony or uh, some tool. Of that. I appreciate that. The one thing I would ask though is if, because ten years have gone by, right. you know, I mean, we'd like to see that brought up to. Okay. Current. Yeah, we we don't have it based on the census data that came out two weeks ago. It's all mm -hmm. it's all new, as you know, and uh, we can update it to the extent that we can. But the history, the historic issues are going to remain very similar. Um, although we had six house districts and three, and before that there were only, there were less. So there has been um, progress in the last redistricting that was quite appreciated and a good thing. Yes, uh, we, because we we can't rely on stale information, as you know. Yes. So what has happened within the last 10 years is important for establishing the cohesive nature and voting as a block. And so any help you can give us in that regard would be yes, very much welcome. Yes, sir. We're happy to help you do your job. I'm telling you <laughs> that we want a good outcome, and I know that you do too. Yes, and, and I, I think it's a, you should be encouraged that we have plans that preserve six districts in the House yes. and three in the Senate. And even although the VRA does not require an influence district. So I, I know you have a lot. I hope you're encouraged. And, and I know that Mr. Gorman has worked very hard. The Pueblos have worked very hard. The Center on Civic Policy have worked very hard. And we're taking very close looks at everybody's map. And I want to thank you on behalf of my uh, client and our coalition which has been those people that and, and entities that you mentioned. And um, we appreciate that you are working with considering their plans and their concepts and the principles that they um, are expecting to be adhered to in the process. Yes, Mr. Uh, Member Sanchez, Joaquin Sanchez, you had a question. Um, I did, I, it was more of a request in terms of uh, what else to include, Ms. Williams? And uh, I don't, uh, again, you're, you're helping us do our job, so I really appreciate that. And I also appreciated the um, crash course in the, uh, the, 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 the legal narrative and the legal history that you shared with us, because that, that's part of what's made this process for me so uh, um, just, you know, en energizing, because I'm learning at almost every one of these uh, hearings. Um, but in addition to the legal arguments and the, the data, um, I also am interested in the process, especially that, that you have followed. And I've been you know, a witness to some of the meetings with the Native American Working Group, uh, the process of engaging your, your respective communities 
and how you've brought that into this process. So if you could include some sense of that and some, uh, uh, some of the framework for that, because I think that's something that is a model for our state. Thank you, we can do that. There have been uh, tons of community interaction between the Navajo Nation government and the smaller um, political entities, um, whether they have a different structure than the state with the uh, agencies and chapters. And there has been a lot of interaction between the uh, smaller units of government and the bigger units of government um, on Navajo. And um, there have been submissions of both written testimony and resolutions from various political subdivisions within the Navajo Nation for your consideration in redistrictor. But we can um, sort of summarize that for you, uh, Commissioner Sanchez. One last question. Yes, sir. Uh, never listen to the lawyers say only have one more question. Right? <laughs> 10 years ago, the Pueblos, the Apaches, the Navajo Nation were able to submit a consensus map. Are you still working toward submitting a consensus map? And if so, any idea of when that might happen? Hope springs eternal, Justice Chavez, and uh, we are not foreclosing the opportunity, but some of the maps that we've seen, there's been some um, issues with retrogression on some of the maps that Navajo can't get behind. And so I think we are still looking to find consensus with whomever. I mean, a coalition map is always better than a lone soldier standing out there by themselves. But we're willing to do that if the principles are not met by any map that is presented. We have very little time left. I know. I, I think Mr. Radigan had his uh, member. Radigan. Uh, yes. uh, member Radigan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Williams, for uh, I really appreciate your informed testimony. And I very much agree with your justification for a population deviation greater than 5%. In particular, it is my informed opinion about the, um, the undercount in Navajo Nation. While my team and I have not done an extensive analysis for a number of reasons, including not having all the available data from the Census Bureau yet. There's many more data be beyond the, the redistricting data that's been released, data related to evaluation and subsequent data sets. Um, and, and so I look forward to the testimony that you said was coming with regards to the undercount. Um, and this has been a, a very informative legal discussion and I, and um, you know, I, I, I'm curious to hear more from our, you know, the attorneys on the committee, from whatever you have to offer, from perhaps the the the, the attorney we have on the attorneys we have on staff, uh, as to you know that interpretation of of 10 percent, whether that means plus and minus five percent or 10 percent in either direction. Um, I can't help, you know, with all that said, I can't help but think about what it would mean for other New Mexicans if the deviation, you know, the, how, depending on how high that deviation goes, we have to balance it out. We have to, um, you know, if it's a 10% deviation uh, in one place, then it's a negative 10% deviation in another place. So I can't help. So I want to support your position, but I can't help but think about what that would mean. And I'm still, I'm still working through that. Um, with that all said, I have more of a technical question that you may uh, defer to Mr. Gorman or somebody else who, who is planning to testify. And, and, it, and it has to do with even the need for us to be having this debate. So my question is, has the working group found it possible to create maps without retrogression, that is six house districts, three Senate districts with 65% uh, voting age population Native Americans, where the deviation is not greater than 5%. In other words, 
can, can it, it, has it just not been possible to create a map or multiple maps where that deviation doesn't go above 5% so that we don't necessarily, you know, do, would we even need to be having this debate if that were possible? Thank you for the question. It's a good question and it's a couple of questions. And first, it is not possible as far as our genius mapper has been able to ascertain to draw six house districts with even above 60% uh, Native American VAP and with, with a standard deviation of minus five or, or, or less. It just isn't, it isn't possible. And I don't think that research and polling has been able to do either because we tried to, we tried to find a solution within the path of least resistance. And it just isn't possible. Um, Mr. Gorman will present some maps with 65% and the best standard deviations you can get there are not good. Um, so we have to use something between 65% Native American map and six districts and having a standard deviation that is constitutionally tolerable. And so that's, that's the answer. That's why we're having this discussion because it's not possible to do it with plus or minus five. And your other question was, I forget. Uh, that was essentially my question. I may have uh, oh. phrased it a, 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 a number of ways, but that was essentially my question. And that was what was implied by this whole discussion, but I just wanted to be clear that that's what the case was. It is clear that it is not achievable at 65% with a plus or minus five standard deviation in six house districts. Thank you. And you're going to love the... Uh, undercount testimony because it's very interesting. I look forward to that. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time and attention. Okay. Uh, let's take a five, 10 minute break. Excellent. Ms. Bernali, you're next though when we
Thank you so much for coming back together. We're going to go ahead and get going. Um, grab some snacks and some water. Don't leave me in the car with those on the way home. I won't fit into my clothes. Um, just a reminder too, many of the folks in the community have made public comments that are longer than the word limit on the website. And so my contact information is on the website. So my name is Lily and you can um, connect and I will make sure that research and polling and the CRC members receive your comments if they exceed um, the limits on the website. Ms. Bernali? Thank you, Lily. Good afternoon, Chair Chavis, committee members, staff and audience. My name is Lauren Bernali. I'm a resident of San Juan County and reside in Sedacon chapter community. I work with the Office of Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission. I want to speak in support of the Building Rights Act 10% floating deviation and the need to formulate this SB 304 deviation. Our office looked at census blocks in various areas of the Navajo Nation in New Mexico to see if the census blocks populations were correct. After our very cursory review, we found 15 sites in Sanosti and Newcomb areas where census blocks identified no one living in these blocks. They are zero population. In these blocks, yet our GPS review clearly shows houses, vehicles, other structures that demonstrate people residing within these blocks. The census blocks are identified as 12012201270121901270121986701208307812082941122260967 and 12315599 I have with me Mr. MC Baldwin Mr. Baldwin is the program manager for the Navajo Nation Rural Addressing Program. And in his work, he provides data under what we call the LUCA data, which is a local updated census addressing. This data is utilized by the census office to identify structures on the Navajo Nation. And what we've done here is we've overlaid the shape files of the census blocks. And um, Mr. Baldwin here is going to show some of the areas where clearly there are residents that reside in these census blocks, but they're counted as zero populations in this area. You can see that roads are driven, the dirt roads are driven on. You can even see livestock and some of the corrals that are there. There are vehicles parked in these areas. And why this happened, we don't know. This short analysis took us 15 minutes to identify these structures that I just, or these census blocks that I just listed. Um, MC, do you want to provide your presentation? Hello, this is MC Baldwin with Division of Community Development Addressing Authority Office. So what we have is point locations of what we call addressable structures or potential address points. So these points will 
get to standard street addresses in the future. And as I zoom in, it takes a while before the rest, before the aerial photo reloads. So when I zoom in, we'll see the actual structures. And we, in this case, see that there are more than four structures, but the polygon or the area that defines the track in this area is listed at, at four. So you can see the structures there. Now I'm gonna zoom out and go to another location. Now, notice this polygon here, it says zero, but yet we see some houses in there. And I'll zoom into one of them in Burnham chapter area. That is, this is the chapter service area. And this area has, says zero, but yet we have structures here and here. And then over here, we have a one in this region, but there's four structures. And, and then there's some more on this side. So here's another zero, but as we zoom in, how we capture these points is by this aerial photo that's dual reference to the ground. And we tell the chapter representation to zoom in to the point where they can see the rooftop. And then they just click on top of the rooftop. So technology is changing so much that we don't need to climb on top of the roof with a GPS unit anymore. So I'm zooming in right now. It's just taking a while to refresh. And notice the percentages on the side. And we found several places with these cases. So when we zoom in, we can see that there are prominent roads that lead to the home site or the adjustable structure portion. And I'm just trying to zoom into at least one area. And there are little pockets of housing or villages, you might say. And While you are zooming in, can you, uh... Tell me what the percentages reflect. There's a red and then a black percentage. Okay, that um, that's in um, District Four, and that that is the deviation of a negative five point seven nine. The Nevada is seven six point forty five percent, and so this is in District Four. I see. Okay. So that's related to redistricting. Right. This uh, a follow-up question, Mrs. Pardon to interrupt. I just want to be clear if we're talking about population or housing units. Right now it's housing units because we don't have population information attached to these points. But the other what we're really pointing out is that there are zero population indicators with this data, but yet we're finding houses. And in some places we are verifying some of these areas to make sure they're not abandoned houses, but, but there's definitely people living there. There's more than one structure. This system that you're using, does it cover all of the Navajo Nation in New Mexico? Yes, it does. So if I zoom out, now not all chapters participate in collecting this information, but if I zoom out, 
to the Navajo Nation level, all these yellow dots are the potential address points. So now we're just only showing the New Mexico side. And notice that there are pockets here and there, but those chapters that are participating, that's where you see concentration of um, addressable structure, point locations, and, and that's what we're using as we look at the, the zero labeling in these areas. So all we're doing is zooming into a polygon that has zero indicator. And we're checking to see if there really is zero people there or if there are structures. And then we have, we have these raster information in the background that allows us to actually look at the structure on the ground. Mr. Baldwin, do you want to explain a little bit about what LUCA and how you interface so, with the census? So our office works with the Navajo Nation chapters and we encourage the chapters to provide information that would tell us where the potential address points are. And every so often, every 10 years, US Census provides these programs that give tribes and other municipalities opportunity to provide data that can be used towards the decennial count. So, we actually grab these points and submit it to U.S. Census, and they use it to, to help locate folks that, that need to be counted out there. So, but not all chapters participate. So we make sure we note that to U.S. Census, and they're, I don't know if they use this as part of the response calculation, from US Census, but we try to indicate that this is not a true representation of, of the distributions of addressable structures out there. So this is a, a way for tribes and other folks to submit their point locations of where people live so that the field staff from US Census can use it to to do their field work portion. What percentage of the chapters participate in the program? Right now for the New Mexico side, I would say half, half of the chapters that spill into New Mexico are participating, but not, not all of them are actually going out to collect information like we expect them to. And there's training involved so that they know how to use the mapping tool and how to capture addressable structures. And we also tell them that they need to capture a primary structure and not a hogan that is sitting maybe 30 yards away that has nothing but storage. So we, teach them what we mean by addressable structures. And, and then we give them tools. We give them access to certain mapping tools. We don't expect them to, to learn too much about the spatial technology, but we give them tools that will allow them to report to us the addressable structures. And then from here, they make an assessment of the distributions of points so that we can then capture or assess the existing road network so that we can capture the 
center lines, the road center lines, and it's those road center lines that we would need to actually establish the physical addresses. So for the New Mexico side, I would say half of what is in New Mexico are participating. They just don't have, they just don't all, they're just not all on the same level with capturing the points for us. Do you have an emergency response system that uh, helps the emergency crew identify where somebody is located? Yeah, that's the intent behind all these, these yellow dots. These points will become potential address points in the future so that it can be shared with the PSAP community, the public safety answering point. And that's where the E911 comes in. But we also tell the folks that it, it won't, it's not just for emergency because you can also use it for, for renewed driver license. So, right, with this map extent, you can see that there's some zeros, but yet there's some housing that are popping up, like in this area. So we just wanted to demonstrate that there are houses out there, but yet the data the set indicate, indicates that there is zero population. And this one's a good example here. I see that. Would it be possible to use this system to then expand it to a statewide address, uniform address system? Yeah. Where, where we could look at population. Yes. And do you, do you know what that would take? That would be in coordination with the local counties and my contact at the state level is uh, the, the FDA. And every so often we have meetings with Gar Clark and some other state officials, but it would, require coordination at that level. And we are part of the geospatial community for these states, because when you're doing GIS work, you also have a separate community of, of folks that, that you're in touch with. So that's how we can make this happen. And then they're also waiting on us to provide some center lines for them because the road center lines can also be used towards broadband activities. And when I get closer, that's when it kind of bails out on me, but we'll see how far we can get with this one. And again, the percentages for each area is displayed. It just doesn't seem to be, oh, there you go. Now we have some better structures that are visible. And that's what we have. I okay. see that. And so what you're telling us is that the Census Bureau reports zero population in these areas, despite the fact that there are existing home structures. Right. This initial analysis is not conclusive as we have just started our review. There's evidence people live in the structures as roads are maintained, livestock is visible, and vehicles are parked in the homes. There is a 2020 census undercount on the Navajo Nation that substantiates the need to formalize the negative deviation to exceed the negative 5%. Clearly, whatever hardships and challenges these families face at the time, census information was gathered, resulted in an undercount that must be considered for justification to allow Navajo's plan that moves forward with a deviation that is referred to as the Voting Rights Act floating 10% deviation. The map to be presented upholds traditional redistricting principles as the criteria for, as the criteria for which we have constructed our map. 
we know there was a 4.9% undercount of Native Americans in the 2010 census count as verified by the US Census Office. We think it's more than 5% of an undercount in 2020. The Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission respect, respectfully requests that the Citizens Redistricting Committee adopt its formal interpretation of SB 304 Voting Rights Act voting deviation. Obviously this presentation, this is the Right now we do have, we have, we show in district four, again, these are the structures that we see in those, um, some of the areas that I had given you in census blocks. And you see people are living there, but we saw that in many of these areas, there was zero population count. I don't know what else US census or what the Navajo nation also integrated in the process of this, but we do have Arvin Mitchell here who was the program manager that um, oversaw the census um, program, the census implementation for the 2020 account. And he, maybe he can provide some other additional information to add to the fact of what other database that they utilize in the count. And I don't know if Mr. Mitchell would like to come up and speak to that. Okay, the 4.9% uh, that you mentioned for the year or the census 2010, the report that they issued was issued in May of uh, 2012. So it takes them about a year to report what the other counts are, right? Yes. Which doesn't yes, help sir. us with the districts. Yes. That concludes presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. While we're doing that transition, next up we have uh, Commissioner um, Genevieve Jackson. She's on the McKinley County Board of Commissioners. Yeah, hey, you're all a safe distance from me, so I'm gonna take my mask off. And I've had all my shots. I'm Genevieve Jackson, McKinley County Commissioner. And several years ago, I was a census worker and I made trips out onto the reservation to locate these people. And there were new houses going up that were not shown on my little clicker or locator. There were also houses that look abandoned, but there was people living in there. And that's due to the third world conditions we have on Navajo. And there's a huge distrust of the government. Many people did not want to be interviewed or did they not want to, did not want to be counted. So, and what I did as a census worker was um, use of, I went back to the same locations where people, where my locator showed that there were people living there and they weren't home. So two or three days later, I went back and they were home. And this is not done. People, the census takers only go one time and that's it. And how do I know this? Because up the canyon, where I live, uh, a census worker came. Yeah. This is a hot subject. Chapter house style. I click on the. <laughs> As I was saying, uh, there's a huge distress amongst my people. And I went back to these homes and I counted them. But that was not done by other census workers. Now, I'm talking several years ago. I don't know what how this last census was conducted. Well, I hope they did it in a much more conscientious manner. Um, up the canyon where I live, and I live in a very rural area, I happen to be out doing census taking. And a worker came by and left a note on my door. 
I was waiting for him to come back, but he never came. And this census worker was all the way from Shepra. I was a census worker living right there. I know where all the people live in that area. I could visit every one of them and I could have interviewed them and registered them. But the way we were assigned, the way the assignments went out by the, I guess the manager or whoever, and they, they were from Flagstaff. They told, they assigned us. And I said, you know, it makes much more sense to have these people that live in that area go out because they know where the people are. But nobody listened to me. And I, there was one other census worker who was very conscientious. She went out on horseback because the roads were impassable to these people's homes. She could not drive her vehicle out there. And there's just other stories uh, in our interaction with one another at meetings. We share these stories, but I don't know if those recommendations were ever followed or given back to the census, the main census manager people up in Denver or wherever. And I just want to share that 10% you're talking about. That is real because I experienced it and I saw it happen. And I had hoped that this 2020 census would be a lot more accountable and would be done in a more fair manner. And from what I'm hearing, it hasn't improved any, it's the same. And this is what happens when you have people at the DC level or the city level giving out information and orders on how to do the census count. They need to come to Navajo land and, and look at where we live and how some of us live, still live, live in third world conditions. And, that in, and that's why they don't trust the government because they don't have plumbing, they don't have electricity. So they say, well, why, why should I vote? My vote doesn't matter because look at how I live. So there is a huge distrust amongst my people of any time the government takes account. So I just wanna relay that to you and add my voice to the reason why the census is inaccurate. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Any questions from the committee? Yes. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Jackson, I just had a question. President Nez made mention of the pandemic and its uh, effect on the census. In your position as a county commissioner, did you hear or see anything uh, about the pandemic event affecting the census vote? Yes, yes, there was an effect by the COVID and people are very wary of one another especially strangers they don't know. Now, speaking from personal experience, I have a sister-in-law who lived not more than 10 miles from her. I had no idea she had COVID. And she passed last week. I'm sorry. And that is, the socialization is zero. And so, and now what we call genitin, and that's faster than the Moccasin Creek line. And so when we, when we used to be able to socialize, we passed these stories around of where the census worker was or what was happening in the community. We're not able to do that any longer. And yes, it does have a, it did have a huge effect. And it still does have a huge effect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next the next speaker we have is Ms. Alukuna. And for folks who are interested in maps that are being referenced, you can go to NM 
redistricting.org. And in the public comments portal, there is a gallery section where you can review the, um, the maps and recommendations others have made. Thank you so much, everybody, <laughs> chair and CRC members. I'm gonna be using the house map E as a reference of my testimony. So as you already know, uh, for the record, I'm Eli Kuna, I'm with the Center for Civic Policy, and we submit our house map concept E. This house map, how it came to really came up a concept. It was really engaging over 40 community-based organizations all across the state, engaging with different and diverse communities of interest, Black, Indigenous, Asian, Latinos, and really in a lens of racial justice and equity, what a cool a map could, we could draw together. That is what the house map is able to come to a life, right? What it does achieve, and I just wanna ground ourselves. what this map achieve is three main things. One, there's no retrogression for majority Native American districts and protects majority Hispanic districts in the Southeast Quadrant. Second, maintain the no Hispanic Native American voting age population that is of 60.9% or better in the main six districts in the Northwest Quadrant. And lastly, this map increased the number of Hispanic majority districts from 24 to 27. This is a really a map that is grounded and rooted in racial justice, equity, and the strengthening minority minority districts. How we achieve that? Number one, as I said before, we center in our communities of interest for the feedback input and empower them to design this map. Number two, we follow the traditional redistricting principles. Number three, we really follow the compliance of the Voting Rights Act. And lastly, and the most important, is that we follow the provision of SB 304. What that means? that we are using the 10% overall range for population deviation. We needed to use that 10% range. Why? Northwest Quadrant lost population and it was undercounted. That has a ripple effect for those six majority minority native districts. So that was a huge challenge for a map because that was a commitment that we did with the Native Redistricting Coalition. So why, how we tackle that challenge? Well, what we tackle that challenge is that we concentrate the negative deviation in the Northwest Quadrant. And by doing that, we were able to do two things. Be able to be in compliance of the Voting Rights Act but at the same time, protecting Native American uh, majority minority districts. So that has a ripple effect in the whole map. So if we take care of the Northwest map quadrant, I'm sorry, we have to adjust the rest of the map. So how we, how we address that? This map, what is able to achieve is that we compensate that negative devi deviation by really balance it out or compensate it with positive deviation, no higher than 3.2, mainly in the Southeast, as you can see, and zoom in, because you can see that we protect the majority minority Hispanic districts. 
that is House District 50A, 61, and 63. So as a summary, and uh, for the record, our house map concept E is using a 10% range, overall range of population deviation because we needed to achieve what our community wanted. And we needed to make sure that we create a map that was rooted in the power and the experience of different child's community that had been disfranchised and systematic oppressed for generations. So that is why you have a memo that is more legal fancy. And if you need any more detail about it, my friend John can answer any question. Thank you, Ali. Any questions from the committee? Ms. Kuna, is there a reason why the Center for Civic Policy, did I say that right? Yes. Doesn't have a, a Senate map for us. Too much work, we, we, we're gonna go there, we're gonna go there. We are working on it, and as we say before, every single map go to the consensus of the table partners, and we are on the works of that. At the same from the congressional congressional district map. But we are in the works. I remember it. thank you, of course. Sounds like everybody's feeling the time constraint pressure. Mr. Wertheim, this is John Wertheim, He's also with the Center for Civic Policy. Chair, members of the committee, uh, my name is John Wertheim, and uh, as uh, so Kuna just, just said, I'm, I'm here to kind of answer any questions about the 10% overall range issue. Um, I know some of the committee members, we were able to get a PDF of our uh, description of principles, which lays out a lot of written discussion of it. And I apologize, I wasn't um, sure how to get a PDF uh, to the commission uh, portal itself, uh, but Lily is taking care of that for me. So I think that, um, that all the committee members can quickly have a PDF of the written document that some of the committee members have had an opportunity to see. Um, the bottom line here is Ms. Kunaso uh, really eloquently and, and factually laid out is that the idea of having an overall range same, th there, this, this idea goes by many different names. Um, it, the, the, uh, the Navajo Nation um, has referred to it as a floating range. I think that's a fine term. The case law, and we're really talking about Supreme Court precedents, does refer to it as a total variation. Okay, and what that means in cases, let, let's take Gaffney as an example uh, for the lawyers on the committee. Uh, but when I talk about Gaffney, it's actually committee, uh, committee member Sanchez who may be the best to understand the Gaffney opinion because he's a math teacher. And really what Gaffney is about in laying out a standard is the idea that you can have something, let's say like a plus or minus 5%. Now that's a property that I can pluck out from any map uh, from a single district and I can say, is this plus or minus 5% population deviation from the norm. That's a property that applies to individual districts individually. It's like I take an apple out of the bend and is that apple red or yellow? That's something that applies to the apple. But if I look at the bin of apples and I want to ask how many apples are in the bin, that is a property that I think math folks and committeeman Sanchez can correct me would call a relational property. It relates to the entire bin of apples, not just a single district. So although the plus or minus five idea, guideline, whatever it is, it's not in any cases really, is saying something that you should use. Um, it's a guideline and it's a, it's a decent guideline. It's very practical because 
this committee, and I, I feel for Mr. Sandoroff, I think that this is the 30th year that I've seen them in this kind of process. Um, you know, from the Navajo Nation, on whose lands we're standing on right now, you're going to, uh, and Mr. Sandoroff has to deal with maps that are just the Northwestern quadrant. So it's not a trivial matter to then draw a map for the entire state that maintains constitutional substantial equality. So there are benefits, practical benefits, Mr. Chairman, Justice Chavez, as you mentioned, to, to being able to take the red apple and just look at how red it is. But that's not the constitutional standard. The constitution, constitutional standard as enunciated in Gaffney and many other cases that are outlined in our presentment is this relational property. It's a property that applies to the entire map. What you really, what, one, what the Supreme Court of the United States has said is that you need to take the most populist, that's a maximum as I think Committee Man Sanchez would say. You take the maximum, the largest, most populous district on a whole map and you compare it to the least populous district. That's a minimum, maximum, minimum. Um, Gaffney also says you can look at other relational properties that apply to the whole map, not just the red apple. You can look at the average, or to be more technical about it, the mean and the median that we learn how to calculate. And what you will see is from what Ms. Kuna was talking about is that if we have to do, we have a problem here in New Mexico, and it's not just a problem for the Navajo Nation. It's a problem also for Farmington, Aztec, and Bloomfield. Northwestern, the 2020 census, and I guess you have to give as much credence to the 2020 census as you want to. Clearly, we can't look at it as a perfect thing, especially in Northwestern New Mexico. So the, so the Navajo Nation, Farmington, Bloomfield, and Aztec, the 2020 census, however accurate it might be, showed a decline in population. And we need to compensate for that. Most fundamentally, we need to compensate it because the Voting Rights Act of 1964 makes us compensate for it. Um, but there also are traditional redistricting principles like preserving Farmington's representation that has really very little to do with the Navajo Nation. And so this, the map that the Center for Civic Policy, and I'm a legal advisor to the center, has presented does exactly that. What does it do in Northwestern New Mexico it goes above 5% negative deviation in six districts. Three of them are on the Navajo Nation largely, but three of them are in Farmington, Bloomfield, and Aztec. And so how then, and I actually think Ms. Kuna described it better than I can, it ripples out, she used the phrase, ripples out throughout the entire state. I think I used a much less felicitous phrase. When I wrote it down, I talked about uh, percolation. I like ripple a lot better. And it ripples out throughout the whole state. And so it's an amazing thing that the center's map drivers achieved in doing all the things that Ms. Kuna laid out. It's an amazing thing. I'm not saying that that is the only way to do amazing things with the map for New Mexico, but that is pretty amazing. And it's especially amazing when you look at, and again, Ms. Kuna gave the number, it's an important number, that the maximum positive deviation in the center's map is only 3.2%. That's how the center, and we're talking about the numbers here, that's how the center achieved dealing with this problem that New Mexico as a state faces a decline in population as shown on the 2020 census in Northwestern New Mexico. Here's the problem, we don't want that very likely census undercount to force us to retrogress the House of Representatives in Navajo and, in, and Native American voting, other Native American voting strength, um, voting strength. We don't want that. But we also don't want it to necessarily violate traditional redistricting principles in Farmington, Bloomfield, and Aztec. They may be less legally significant, but they're still significant. And so what's amazing about the map from a mathematical perspective is that it achieves this 
with a lower average deviation than Mr. Sandroff's was. I'm not suggesting that that means it's fairer or better or whatever. It's just a fact. So the Center for Civic Policies map has the lowest average uh, deviation of all of the five concept maps in the House of Representatives. And this is not just idle talk, because if one looks at the Gaffney opinion, it, one of the reasons that Gaffney laid down the standard was not just on this 10% idea, but it was also on, for example, the Gaffney court approved a house map because, quote, the average deviation from the ideal house district was only about 2%. Okay, that's average. That's the bin of apples. That's not a single apple. And so our map achieves about a 2% average deviation as well. Center's map. Map concept E. So the 10% standard is really the standard that we should be talking about because it's in SB 304. Um, and moreover, it is, and it's, it's again referenced in the, the submittal that we've made to the commission as a comment, but the, you know, the National Conference of State Legislatures at the beginning of this whole cycle that was gonna come, they published in January of 2020, a comparison of the overall ranges, the floating range, the total variation, however we want to call it, comparing all 50 states in the union. And they published it and they defined their table. And I encourage everybody, the web link is in the submittal that we've made to the committee. Um, I, I encourage people to take a look at it, but its preamble says, the NCSL, the National Conference of State Legislature states the overall range is perhaps the most commonly used measure of population equality or inequality of all districts, which can be expressed as a percentage relative or the actual population numbers absolute. The overall range, and now I'm just quoting in parts, I'm paraphrasing, is the quote, difference in population between the largest and smallest districts. It's a property of the map as a whole. It's a bin property. It's not a property of an individual apple. It's not a property of an individual um, district. And so I think Ms. Kuna laid out better than I could why that was a good idea, why that concept, that principle of map drawing needs to happen this year in some fashion or another. And I'm not suggesting that Mr. Sandroff maps don't do that. I'm just suggesting that the need is very high under the Voting Rights Act and other principles. And um, I stand open for any questions that the committee might have. Any questions from the committee? You heard me outline what I would like for the record in my discussions with Ms. Williams. So yeah, I, I encourage you to do the same. Yeah, I'm, I mean, with respect, Justice Chavez, I have read your comment, and I, and I do want to um, mention one aspect of it that I, 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 I do disagree with. And that is that I don't think any exceptional circumstances, I think was your phrase, um, needs to be shown by the citizens who are drawing maps to justify these deviations. In, in, my, in, in the center's very strong view, is the committee's present concept maps for the House, A, B, C, and D, are in the exact same constitutional legal boat as concept E from the Center for Civic Policy. Why do I say that? No exceptional circumstances need to be shown by the Center or any other citizen map drawer. And here's why because all of them are presumptively constitutional as long as they're within that 10% range, floating range, overall range. And so I do not think that there are any cases that I'm aware of that suggest that there is a standard of a plus or minus 5%, that that's the constitutional standard. I'm not aware of any cases. I could be wrong. I haven't read every case in this area. It's vast. I'm not aware. I know that the New Mexico state statutory law also 
reinforces the idea that it's not innate. It's not the citizens that have to show some exceptional fact, um, but it, it is in fact just the rule that the 10% floating range, the 10% total variations in the statute is, is what the standard is. And I think all of the maps are presumptively constitutional for the State House of Representatives, including the Center for Civic Policies Map E. Right, and you know what presumptively means, right? I do. What? And, 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 and that's why it'd be important to show, for example, uh, VRA compliance. Well, and that's a very, that's an excellent point. I think it's, but, but let's not be mistaken, just because a map if one looks, and I may be mishearing what you're saying, Chairman Justice Chavez, and so if I am, I apologize, but it's important that we are li literally the center's map and, and Mr. Sandoff's maps are in the same legal boat. It is also possible that a map that is within plus or minus five could violate the constitution. Um, if there was some discriminatory intent or something like that, and so, the presumption of constitutionality applies to all five maps equally. And so I do think that as far, Ms. Kuna actually provided a lot of that detail and we can provide more, but the fact that we achieved it with lower average deviation than map, concept maps A, B, C, and D, and in addition, increased uh, native, like Hispanic voting representation in other parts of the state of New Mexico and, you know, retain representation for uh, black communities in Eastern New Mexico and things like that. That's all a pretty amazing achievement. And the main reason to look at it is because it means that one can see what is possible facing this problem of the United, uh, this 2020 census, perhaps incorrectly, showing a decline in population in Northwestern New Mexico. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you again. Yeah, it's great to see you all. Yeah, good to see our both hands. Thank you. <laughs> I back on. No worries. I'm sorry, I got right in your space. Next, we have the Honorable um, Chairman Daniel So. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, hey. Hola. Como esta? Muy bien, gracias. <laughs> yeah. Um, don't let me fool you. I only know enough Spanish to order coffee at a cafe <laughs> and perhaps uh, start a fight in the street. So, like I said, don't let me fool you. But uh, I come to you with. with uh, a, a unique experience. And, and it comes from having been the youngest member of the Navajo Nation Council in 1986. In 87, I was appointed by then uh, Chairman Peter McDonald to serve on the Navajo Nation Board of Election Supervisors. And one of the first actions that we basically did was to purchase the electronic voting machine. The other aspect was to assure a higher voter turnout. We coincided the Navajo Nation elections with the state and federal elections. And so that was a, a point that <clears throat> uh, basically to uh, effect uh, voter participation and as a banning effect, be able to uh, garner state and federal programs as well as uh, in, in specificity to the state of New Mexico, uh, we see programs, uh, education, uh, health, social services, 
and uh, more specific general obligation bonds. By participating in those aspects, we, we are able to bring programs to our chapter areas, hopefully to help in the socioeconomic development of each of the chapters. <clears throat> Mr. Emsley uh, Baldwin attempted to demonstrate the houses that exist as part of the effort of rural addressing. In Torreon chapter, the chapter participated with the county to do rural addressing. They have to expend monies for the posts and the sign. One of the findings of that particular Part and, and the main thing is, Mr. Baldwin says, not all the chapters are participating. The chapter basically said, we'll go with this side. <clears throat> the effect is of the pandemic, after the census count was done, many young folks, middle-aged folks moved back to their parents' homestead, thus creating multi-generational homes. And so in that aspect, then we are undercounted. And, and part of this other effort of rural addressing, we are then able to estimate the cost of a water line to a home, estimate the cost of power line extension to a home. Uh, based on the same aspect that Mr. Baldwin presented. And I just wanted to say that to uh, reinforce the fact that the census, Navajo folks did not participate as fully as they should have. There was a great effort by the Navajo Census Commission to get out. But by that time, there was the aspect of remote counting. And part of the effect is some of the chapters do not have good internet connectivity, even though they may have a smartphone to be able to participate. In some of the areas, there is such a thing as Verizon Hill, a high mesa in the community may be the only place that they have cell phone reception. Come off the mesa back to the homestead in the valleys, there is no internet connectivity. So that's an aspect that uh, seriously affects uh, the ability to uh, basically participate as if you were a citizen living in Santa Fe, Española. And I, even there, I hear there's areas mm -hmm. limited uh, connectivity. So it is an aspect of New Mexico. The other part I want to um, emphasize is in the early, well, late 80s, we also uh, experienced at-large voting. We did file a civil rights complaint against the Cuba Independent School District. And the result was the court ordered single member district voting. And, and so that was also, uh, and that had a far reaching effect. That decision caused San Juan College to go to single member districting, whole group district. Uh, the school district over there went to single member district. And Winslow, those other two schools that 
the effect is three out of the five members are Navajo. At the Cuba School District, three members out of five are Navajo. So it does, I've seen it work. And I grew up in an era where we watched on TV the civil rights marches and the effect in our own uh, unique way we used to call the Voting Rights Act, the Voting Riots Act, because those riots, the marches, caused the adoption of the Civil Rights Act and the effect of the Voting Rights Act. So that is um, just to give you a, a, an aspect. I was fortunate enough to be named by Speaker Damon to be on the Navajo Redistricting Committee. And in the first meeting, my first requirement is these district lines have to coincide with the chapter boundaries. Why? Over at Casamira Lake, one of the districts, the chapters within the district that I represent. On voting day, the folks on the east part of Casamira Lake vote in chapter Navajo Nation, state and federal and county elections right there at the chapter house. The folks on the west side, they vote in Casamira Lake for Navajo Nation and chapter elections, they have to drive uh, anywhere from 15 to 22 miles to Smith Lake to vote there in the county, the state, and the federal elections. So and November 4th isn't always a sunny, dry day. Mm -hmm. We usually have rain, snow, and of course, the effect of muddy roads. So that's why I came into the committee to ask that the district lines follow chapter boundaries. Again, the effect will be an increased voter turnout in both elections. And that's the ultimate. The one thing that we come into this presentation is the weight of one vote should be equal. One person's vote should be equal to another person's vote in Albuquerque in a metropolitan area, a high population density. That's how come they have smaller districts over there because of the um, aspect of uh, the guidelines that we're all talking about today. And so, and, and that's, uh, again, uh, the aspect of equality, and we ask that uh, what's been presented by the different folks. For me, individually, what Mr. Wertheim presented, the aspect from the Center for Civic Policy, their description of the principles used in House concept map relating to the 10% overall range of population deviation is what I for myself fully support because <clears throat> one, it has, does not affect dilution. One, it concentrates the aspect of 
voting power that we have not really talked about. And, and that's the part that, uh, and, and the various maps that are presented, it kind of like blurs what I want with this particular support of uh, the Center for Public uh, Civic Policy is the ability to draw distinct lines, one that will reinforce our people's voting rights. And in, in that aspect, I, I really appreciate. And I guess the other part that I really should in, reinforce is when I was at, uh, the council delegate back in 1987, I filed a complaint with the voting rights uh, division of the US Department of Justice. And the complaint basically was settled with Secretary of State. One of the parameters of that <clears throat> negotiation was the Secretary of State had to hire Native American voter education specialists. And as a result, San Juan, McKinley, Sandoval, and the other uh, counties that had high population got those positions. And again, uh, the aspect is participation. In the most recent chapter election, in um, 2019, that Torian chapter, it used to be the folks that were aged 60 and older were the majority voters. With everybody having to come home in the multi generational home. The voting age majority, the range was 35 to 45 years old. So we are experiencing the fact that the younger folks are wanting to participate in that aspect of just voting basically then strengthens local government. And that's the part that I think we really want to impart to the committee. We appreciate um, your attendance. Some of the names that were divulged, Smith Lake, Mariano Lake, Casimiro Lake, White Horse Lake, you might think that this is the land of the lakes, <laughs> but uh, in reality it is in the early days when the stock ponds were being full, that was the major uh, physical demarcation. And that's how some of these uh, chapters got their names. So in, in that aspect, uh, thank you, uh, Chief Justice Chavez, and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, we certainly look forward to um, getting the Navajo um, preference to be incorporated into what will be presented to the New Mexico legislature. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Thank you very I much. Think I have just one question, Chairman. I just need to understand something. So we've heard overwhelmingly the desire for the precincts to be drawn based on chapter houses in San Juan County and McKinley. And I thought I heard that a decision had been made and then it wasn't. Do you, what is the current decision with San Juan County? And I know Mr. Sandroff may be aware of this, but I, I'm just not. And, and yes, uh, that decision was made late. And, and I guess we haven't really re-looked at that. For myself, 
it does split uh, folks within chapters. And, and uh, yes, it is troubling, but that's the commission. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. The next person we have signed up is Joseph Hernandez. Jo is Joseph still here? Yes. Yate, she, Joseph Hernandez, and she, Koganishle, Nake Bashichi, Ashinta to Che, a Nake Deshanale, Yate, um, redistricting, um, Commission, Commissioner Chavez, and, uh, um, my, uh, Che, my, my, uh, um, uh, uh, my chase from um, from this community, uh, uh, 11 miles uh, east of Chaco Canyon, is where my uh, chase family's from, and uh, we have a uh, uh, allotment uh, over there that, that my my family still holds on to. So uh, I appreciate you guys coming out to this region. It means means a lot to me, knowing that uh, you guys are uh, here. And um, this this is also oh uh, uh, I am the Dene energy organizer for a Neva education project, um, you know which we are also uh, part of the Native Redistrict Redistricting Coalition. Um, I, I work and I live in the community of Shiprock, and uh, I'm also a volunteer on the uh, Navajo Nation uh, Head Start Parent Policy Council, which. Uh, um, you know, I think it's an important position. Um, I also uh, am a, a community organizer, so I, I definitely, um, you know, this is this is a, a big uplift, you know, to to the, the role and responsibility that this commission has going forward uh, to uh, understand and and uh, you know when taking in these uh, different concepts, th these maps that you guys will be uh, considering. And um, it, 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 it's with that thought that, you know, I, I think it's important that, you know, when, when uh, we um, put these uh, um, maps to, to, together, that w w whichever maps that you guys choose, we want you to ensure that the, um, that it, it, it's the native, um, um, uh, concentrations that, that are 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 um, the those areas of, of interest that were um, I, I I think it was it was the last meeting that I, I that you guys had that really caught my attention you know when um, it was mentioned um, that San Juan County population had had decreased <laughs> you know um, however uh, you know. Just know that while it did decrease, the native population in San Juan County increased. It went from 47,000 in 2010 to 50,000, <laughs> you know? And while, you know, it, 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 it did de decrease, but I, I think that that's important, you know, to, to, to know. Um, and, and that uh, um, what was mentioned earlier, especially with rural addressing uh, with MC Baldwin, is that, you know, if, if you guys go off the main roads and travel the, the tribal roads, it, you'll see a lot of communities and, and a lot of households that they, they're, they're, you know, their living situations is, is in these modular homes, in, in these pre-built homes, you know, that um, a, a lot of communities, uh, you know, just because housing is, is, is such, a need out here, and, and, and I think that, that that's what's, what's important is that you know the, 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 the there's a lot at stake over here, you know, 
uh, education's at stake. <laughs> you know, healthcare is at stake. <laughs> you know, and 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 I think when when you guys uh, uh, push through with with, with, with these maps, you know, we want to make sure that certain aspects are are implemented. You know, especially like this the the ten percent. Uh, you know, deviation, and and that there's um, all of that gets maintained. You know, in in, in these concepts that, that we we, we um, hope that are well represented of the you know um, minority uh, Hispanic and Native American of uh, uh, population. You know that that they get um, that we get. Maps that are well represented and, and, and that are that don't lead to disenfranchisement, you know, and that we continue to um, uh, move move forward with with a more equitable, um, you know, and and and, and I think um, having um, uh, the, the support of, of tribal. Consensus consensus maps is, is also important, especially when it comes to like Senate District Thirty. You know, I, I think that we we definitely uh, are are uh, you know asking you know that you know that that takes in, in consideration. So uh, I, I appreciate this time. I appreciate you guys having uh, me uh, to be able to um, um, be able to express my um, you know. Uh, um, comment through, through this period. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for what you do with the education part. Appreciate that. Any questions from the committee? Thank you. How many more are signed up to speak? We have 12 more people signed up, but they may not have all had the endurance. So we shall see. And then, Sunny, do we have anybody online? Not at this time. So well, when are we going to get to Mr. Gorman? He's our grand finale. Okay, so let's uh, let's <clears throat> let's remember that we do have others that want to present. So let's try to uh, understand that we should be succinct. Yes, sir. In their remarks. I really want to hear from Mr. Gordon. Great. Is Chloe Jake still here? I think it's Chloe. I thought I was good. Okay. Nawa, Hopa, hello. Thank you, Chair and Committee members, for allowing me an opportunity to speak today. And thank you to the Navajo Tab community here for being so generous with your space, resources, and providing snacks and welcoming us within your community, even in the midst of this ongoing pandemic. My name is Chloe Jake. I am a citizen of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma and a descendant of the Pueblo of Laguna and Mescalero Apache tribe, among a few more tribal affiliations. I'm here on behalf of the Native Redistricting Coalition, but I'm also a member of the El Pueblo Council of Governors Ad Hoc Redistricting Committee and the Native American Work Group. That includes APCG and the members of the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission, who have so diligently been working to achieve the redistricting goals of the Navajo Nation. In all of my redistricting memberships, we are united in our goal to advance district plans that improve and maintain the voting strength within Native American majority districts. Our processes have been undertaken with an enormous amount of care and deliberation. As Ms. Patty Williams stated previously, we have been working through this process based upon a set of principles that include no retrogression, maintaining the 65% Native American voting age population, and not diluting the voting strength of Native American populations and their ability to elect the candidates of their choice. Our foremost guiding principle has been that of upholding the doctrine of tribal self-determination. Our leaders have been very careful and deliberate in their determinations of which districts they wish their communities to belong to. They came to these decisions based upon shared interests, linguistic similarities, historical connections to one another, and connections to sacred sites and natural landmarks that, uh, that extend far beyond any reservation boundary. 
I cannot overstate the importance of these decisions enough. As has been previously stated, there are currently six state house districts and three Senate districts. Native American communities have a heavy presence within Congressional District 3 and an influential presence within Congressional Districts 1 and 2. I must again state that we cannot accept any plans that are retrogressive and reduce the existing number of Native American majority districts. Our coalition has submitted state house, state senate, and congressional district plans to districter that were drawn with the support and guidance of the 19 Pueblos, Hickory Apache Nation, and Mascalero Apache Tribe. Complete tribal consensus has always been the goal, and continues to be something that the Native American Work Group is working to achieve. As it stands, House Concept E most closely captures the will of sovereign nations, and we are working with the Center for Civic Policy to adopt district lines, but this remains a fluid process. As we work through this process, I ask that the committee, who has been very understanding and supportive of tribal efforts thus far, continue to exercise that same level of support and understanding as all 23 tribal nations and pueblos find a path that they agree upon. It is a huge undertaking and one that tribal leaders and that we as advocates and community members do not take lightly because we understand the far reaching implications that this process has on improving the quality of life for our people. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Mr. Melvin Foster. Mr. Foster, are you still here? Going once. All right. Gone. <laughs> um, Ms. Charlotte Little. Who should get a frequent flyer badge. I'm coming to so many of the meetings. You should get a frequent flyer badge for coming to so many of the meetings. <laughs> get credit. I <I'll> love it. <laughs> well, good evening, Chairman. Travis and nice member Curtis, you. it's good to see you as well. And good evening to the members that are on Zoom. So um, as you may know, um, I, my name is uh, Charlotte Little. And this evening, I'm offering some brief comments specifically on the census, uh, more specifically the undercount that resulted in the 2020 census. And uh, it's important uh, to note, um, I served in the, during the 2020 census as a coordinator for the Tribal Census Coalition. In this effort, the coalition worked with all the tribes of the 23, all 23 tribes and urban communities in the state. And we also had over 70 partners, which included um, all of the all public council of governors. I count New Mexico, the state of New Mexico Indian Affairs Department, the Center for Civic Policy, national and local native community organizations such as the National Congress of American Indians, the National Indian Council on Aging, the National Indian Youth Council, various health organizations, other NGOs, and so many more uh, entities who were committed to ensure an accurate and complete count uh, of households in New Mexico, and specifically in our case, native households. So as a coordinator, I work closely with the tribal complete count committees to turn out the count. And as we know now, an accurate and complete count of native communities was made difficult because of the challenges that the pandemic presented. We're very aware uh, that the, as many of us are aware that the Census Bureau's data that was published in August uh, reflects an undercount of the native population. And so for an example, I present this, experience of two tribal communities, Kiwa or Santo Domingo Pueblo and the Hickory Apache Nation. At the conclusion of the 2020 census, these two communities, despite the hard work and the efforts that were made, they had recorded response rates by the Census Bureau of 57% at Kiwa and 17.9% at Hickory. It's worth noting that in 2010, those population numbers, the response rate actually showed zero because there was no data to capture that information, uh, to collect that information. So recently, in the last four weeks, uh, the enrollment director at GIWA 
let me know that the final census count that she observed did not comport with what they have in their census. It would, did not accurately reflect their population. So again, as we know, the challenges to get an accurate and complete count also included, included the two pieces processes specifically, the update leave process and the non-response follow-up phase, which were either delayed or did not take place in tribal communities because they were closed, as we know, to protect the community members and the Census Bureau employees. Now, these examples are only two of the many reasons we believe that the census data is flawed and distorts the actual native population numbers. To conclude, I urge consideration be provided to allow for the flexibility of deviation rates. I thank you for your time and the opportunity to address you. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Thank you, sir. Next, we have Ms. Atta Chavez. Who Chairman Chavez may remember from um, yes. our task force. This is my prima. Hello, hello. My name is Atsadan Chavez. I am Bitatni born for Kiwa Pueblo. <laughs> and I am a member of the Navajo Nation from Sanasti, New Mexico, and from Kiwa Pueblo. I'm the current uh, executive director of NAVA Education Project and NM Native Vote. Thank you uh, to the CRC for allowing me to speak. <laughs> Sorry, there, I should have drank a little bit more water. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we led the 2020 New Mexico Native Census Coalition and now the Native Redistricting Coalition. And this has been a huge labor of love that has taken up a lot of our time in these past couple of years. We began our redistricting work about five months ago with the intent not to be prescriptive, excuse me, but to help support all 23, oh, thank you, <laughs> tribal sovereign nations in New Mexico with this redistricting process. We did not want to prescribe what we felt were best solutions for tribes, but instead we attempted to listen and provide the tools for tribes to tell us what works for them. So again, we began this work focusing on our redistricting principles and key to those are the doctrines of self-determination and tribal sovereignty. The ability of all 23 tribal sovereign nations to determine where their lines will be. And as you know, case law has supported the tribal rights to do this. Enforcing the doctrine of self-determination is imperative to all political, social and economic process, progress, excuse me, for the tribes of New Mexico. During the 2011 redistricting litigation, the state district court found that the continued effects of historic discrimination in education, employment, and health hinder tribal ability to effectively participate in the political process. In that respect, tribal communities are in the best position to determine what is best for their own communities. And in fact, New Mexico law requires that the court consider tribal self-determination as a factor in drawing these legislative districts. The CRC process is our hope to have citizens actually make the decisions on behalf of their communities instead of what historically we've been able to do. And we're hopeful that we can prevent the litigation process by having meaningful conversations with all tribal nations in an effort to uh, gain consensus. So respect must be given to the historical and cultural heritage sites that have been visited and maintained by indigenous people since time immemorial, and that those borders are not in fact fence lines or voting precincts, but they're held by the oral tradition of tribes themselves. And we ask that the CRC respect the tribe's ability to self-govern and the right to equitable representation at the state and national level. We also move our work forward 
to ensure that we kept communities of interest that share political, social, economic, or historical interests together. We wanted to prevent any retrogression or dilution of voting strength. Native Americans make up approximately 12.4% of the total state population, which means that we play a significant role in national, state, and local elections. A majority of tribal reservations lie within the Northwest quadrant of the state, but many tribes have ancestral ties to the land that extended much further than any reservation boundaries. Native Americans in Northwestern New Mexico have traditionally voted and continue to vote as a politically cohesive group. For Native Americans in New Mexico, state and congressional representatives must be able to demonstrate an educated investment in the interests and issues that concern tribes. And this is one of the main reasons why we're engaging in this process. <laughs> the situation this redistricting cycle is even more problematic because of the increased undercount in the Northwest Project. Because we led the, led the NM Native Census Coalition, we saw firsthand how the 2020 census enumeration period did not achieve an accurate census count. Charlotte was able to provide a few of those examples. And there's a huge undercount of the rural and native populations here where we are today. The Navajo Nation had a 22.5% response rate and the Hickory Nation that borders the Navajo Nation had a 19.8% response rate. So that's what an estimated 70 plus percent of these populations that were not counted. Meaning the data set that we are working with that was meant to accurately count our populations is flawed. That's why we asked that CVAP and deviation standards should be reviewed with scrutiny because we know our population is there even though the data might not suggest so. So the plus minus 5% deviation is far too stringent a standard or requirement um, that may cause retrogression and dilute our native voting power. <coughs> we understand that there was a population and loss in Farmington due to some of the losses in oil and gas jobs, but those numbers are not equally reflected in the surrounding tribal communities who have long established historical ties with the land. So again, incorrectly requiring native majority districts to stay within that minus plus 5% necessary, necessarily dilutes our voting strength relative to the current districts. So the purpose of setting that 10% maximum deviation was to ensure that the smallest or the most underpopulated district did not deviate from the largest or most overpopulated district by more than that 10% variance. The Navajo Nation's Council has provided a good overview of case law on this issue, and I'd like to just add a few additional points. When the current uh, maps were enacted in 2012, the smallest districts were minus five in HD 65 and minus 45 in HD 9. Although the concentration of Native American voters in the six core VRA protected districts has increased, the census data reflects a reduction in overall population. When those districts are expanded to make up that population, what we are effectively doing are diluting the Native American voting strength of those districts. We know that our populations are there. And it is possible to maintain the Native American voting strength in all six districts within a 5% deviation if you're able to push those deviations to minus 6.5 or minus 7, you can avoid retrogression. That means the rest of the state can involve any deviations greater than three or 3.5%. It's gonna be a hard ask, but it's doable. We've been working with our colleagues across the state to make sure that we stay within that 10% range, but that we know in those areas where the population has severely undercounted in a lot of the rural and native communities that we work together to stay within that deviation point. The unfortunate difference between not exceeding that plus or minus minus 5% deviation is that it uh, doesn't allow for the leeway where we may need to go to a seven or 8% deviation, but stay within that total 10%. And what we would like to ask the CRC is to adhere to the Supreme Court standard of that maximum deviation of 10%, whether it runs minus five to plus five or minus seven to plus three, which might be referred to as that floating range, because we know 
within our work within the census that the population is there and we need to make sure that we do not dilute that voting strength. There are currently state, six state house districts and three state Senate districts where Native Americans make up the majority and there are nine Native American legislators. So earlier I said there's 12.4% um, of us. So we are working through this process to create more equitable representation relative to our share of the population. Our best guess is that our maps when integrated with CCP's map E have a deviation of roughly 9.37%. They don't quite follow that plus minus deviation rule, but they are well within that 10% deviation. And again, we should not dilute the native vote by packing or cracking our population. And we are being intentional to make sure that we build up districts and that we pay attention to more than just the raw population, but also the voting trends. I mentioned that I'm the ED of NM Native Vote as well. This is work that we've been engaged in since the 1990s. So we've been keeping track of the voting trends and the voting um, will and history of a lot of our Native populations across the state. So keeping racially polarized voice voters meaningfully together in accordance with the Voting Rights Act is one of the things we've been looking at as we've been creating these consensus maps. Our maps took the time they did, and I know we were late with some of them, because of the process we undertook to speak with all New Mexico's tribes, and we are very near a full consensus. We literally spoke to every single one of the 23 sovereign nations across the state, some numerous times and others with their regional groups and neighboring tribes to make sure we achieved consensus as a whole. We're working with a lot of puzzle pieces and it's been an extremely difficult um, process at times, but we are excited to continue to work towards total consensus, knowing that in the end game, we're gonna increase our voter strength for the natives in this state. Map E is the closest concept so far, and we're still working to integrate our, as much of our consensus maps into that particular concept, but we also hope to create a map that has all of our concepts maps I'm sorry, consensus maps on one concept version. Uh, the current tribal concepts maps do not retrogress and they actually grow native voting influence through the preservation of communities of interest in particular in House District 69 and House District 65. The consensus maps also follow the direct wishes of the Sleto Pueblo as an example to remain in a community of interest with Western Pueblo tribes as opposed to being forced into a district which already has many diverse communities to satiate. The development of a Senate District 30, which has greater native influence, will likely provide assurances that those voting tribes within the district will have a respected electoral voice. For the past 10 years, the native candidate of choice has consistently lost by a margin of less than a thousand votes. And in 2012, with a margin of less than 14 votes. By increasing the native concentration, it gives the tribes a greater opportunity to select the candidate of choice. These maps were developed under tribal resolutions that uphold the principles of redistricting that we all agreed upon. We said, these are our game rules that we're gonna abide by, and we have to have the respect of each one of these sovereign nations as we move forward. This process empowers and respects tribal sovereignty, culture, and voting power. And again, we engaged in this work because we recognize the direct impact that state and federal elections have on our health, economic outcomes, education opportunity, overall justice, voice, and our ability to maintain our sacred connections to our cultural practices and ancestral lands. So again, I thank you for your time and I thank you for your continued work to ensure the people of New Mexico have a voice in this process. Questions from the committee? So Ms. Chavez, um, I really appreciate your uh, very articulate presentation. The, you heard the question from the chair earlier about, about uh, data for uh, racial polarized voting. Um, I think that would be very helpful if that was possible, if you could make that available to us um, so that we can look at that that particular aspect uh, in looking at maps. Um, you've covered so many different areas. The, the last thing I'll ask you is, 
do you have an idea of when you'll have a consensus maps in all three areas? So right now we're almost in, uh, finished with the three maps that we are the map that we have for our house districts. Um, we're almost done incorporating what we currently have on redistrictor onto uh, CCP's map. We have a couple of areas in the north uh, eastern quadrant that we're completing, and we're hoping to have those integrated um, by the end of the week as well. So by the end of the week, we're hoping to have the majority of those together, and we have a scheduled meeting with some of the other tribes that we still have to uh, come to the table to, to come to, to negotiate with to figure out where those last lines are going to lie. But we're very close to that uh, end game process. And we've been working with our table partners and CCP to make sure that we can uh, make this process as easy as possible for you all in the sense of incorporating as much as we can into a consensus map that has been vetted with uh, not only tribal leadership, but also leaders across the state and all of the BIPOC community. And so do you anticipate having Senate maps and congressional maps in addition, not just the House map? We're uh, pretty much good with our congressional version. We will be having conversations to finish that particular version. And we have Senate maps that we have been just holding off to have final negotiations with a couple of the sovereign nations to make sure that um, they are clear with the decisions they've made as a whole and that we can submit them. What we've been trying to do is have each of these tribal nations submit their maps along with a letter that you know is officially signed off by tribal leadership and or their councils to say, here's our decision and make that available. So some of the communities have already uploaded those on the Redistrict R uh, website, but what we're doing now is putting them all into one larger map so that you can have that. And that would be something that you can easily reference to know where tribes stand in terms of those consensus areas. Okay, um, and your timing for the last set. Um, let me ask you one thing, uh, maybe just to cut to the quick. Will you please contact the committee and tell us when the maps are in? I, I keep bugging Mr. Sandra. Do we have the tribal maps? Do we have the tribal maps? And, and it would be great if you could just let us know. Sure. So we will just make sure that once they're available, um, I can't remember the, the, the name of the lady that's with the CRC, but we'll make sure that she has is in receipt of them even prior to uploading on Redistrict R so that there's no uh, lapse in time. And then we will uh, let you, know, you and Justice uh, uh, Chavez know so that you're aware as soon as those are uploaded. But please know that we've been working round the clock. We've been making a lot of calls, uh, making a lot of food for everyone to eat <laughs> as we've been coming together to, 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 to figure out where these lines are going to be as a consensus of, of the tribes. I appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate your work as well. Uh, I wanted to ask you because you talked about it in Farmington, you talked about it today as well. Uh, voter participation increasing. Do you see that increase in participation across the six House districts and the three Senate districts? We do see those increases. I know in this past 2020 cycle, it was a little crazy because we had some polling locations that closed in the primaries, but by the general election, um, our participation numbers were actually higher than some of the previous years. Um, so we are continually to make sure that we get out the vote in these areas. But, you know, key to that is also some of the funding. I know the Secretary of State's office is working to get additional funding for tribes. But in some areas, especially on the Navajo Nation, you know, if you have a polling location, but you have a gravel parking lot, that doesn't qualify as, uh, you know, accessible for voters. And so that simple change of making that a uh, paved road is the difference between that being a viable voting location for a lot of folks. And then we also have the issue with the languages that we have across the state. We've been trying to provide as much um, funding for those types of trans 